Broadway Comes Back by Jack Crawford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. Since last I wrote for these pages, many plays have come and gone along our Manhattan highway, sacred to Dionysus. A philosopher, who should chance to take up his tub and place it at the intersection of Broadway and 42nd Street, would have before his eyes many examples of the mutability of human affairs wherewith to feed his meditations. The star that dazzled last week, outshining the largest electric sign, is now as far from our mythical philosopher's ken as Betelgeuse. But if I am not careful, I shall grow sentimental over Broadway, and its swiftly turning wheel of dramatic fortune. There are enough sentimental persons roaming Broadway as it is. The second daintily finished production of the season, the first was The Young Visitors. To pass on was The Beggar's Opera, another illustration that one has to be careful when using a light touch upon the keys of Broadway's instrument. Instead of pleasant harmony, you may find only silence. This eighteenth-century ballad opera, remote ancestor of musical comedy, with old quaint airs and picturesque quality, did not repeat in New York its London success. The scenery and costumes by my brother-in-law, advertisement, C. Lovett Fraser, were, if you will permit me to say so, charming. But the beggar's opera demands an audience to whom stage history and stage traditions have a meaning. Sir James Barry's Mary Rose seems to me a pulling play. At first I thought I must be too literal-minded to understand what the author meant. After listening carefully, however, to the exposition of this play by several of my friends, some of whom argue with much emphasis, I am still puzzled. Each friend gave me a different explanation. Now, as a general principle, a play should be enjoyed without explanation. Apply this to Mary Rose, and you discover yourself floored, as one of Dickens' characters has it. You have, it is true, enjoyed some of it, but you will go away with question marks sticking all over your mind. As the play has been published, the best thing is to leave the puzzle for the solution of each individual. As for me, I shall return to dear Brutus, and let who will worry over Mary Rose. Eugene O'Neill must certainly be considered for the present one of the important American dramatists. It is true that Chicago did not think so highly of Beyond the Horizon as New York did, but agreement should be attained when the Emperor Jones travels westward. And now Mr. O'Neill is giving us, at special matinees, different. There is a quality of pessimism in Mr. O'Neill's point of view that is not especially American. Nevertheless, he is a sincere artist and is working hard to interpret what he sees. I shall return again in another issue to this drama. Another important American play is Zona Gale's Miss Lulu Betts, her own dramatization of her novel. This is the second of Mr. Brock Pemberton's productions, the first being Enter Madam. Mr. Pemberton has kept up the high standard of acting, which he set for a goal in his earlier offering. Again, a controversy has raged, because Miss Gale gave her play a happy ending. At least, it now ends with a marriage. The very critics who indict Mr. O'Neill for pessimism because his plays end unhappily score Miss Gale for changing hers. Of course, the real question is whether any given ending is logical. Hero, married to Claudio, at the conclusion of Much Ado About Nothing, never struck me as a particularly happy ending. An ending is not necessarily happy because the author says it is. Miss Gale, however, has defended herself with great cleverness, and, on the whole, with reason. In any event, Miss Lulu Betts is one of the plays to see. Next to be mentioned is Sacha Gautry's Debreau, in a rhymed translation by Granville Barker. It is a dramatization of stage traditions, the story of Debreau, the famous clown of the Funambules at Paris. As a play, its charm depends upon the acting and the production. 
both of which are excellent. Mr. Lionel Atwell plays the lead with skill and finesse. There has been much critical controversy aroused by Mr. Barker's translation, particularly concerning his rhymes. The lines are short and of irregular length. Some of the actors come down rather heavily on the rhymes, and modern ears are not accustomed to rhyme upon the stage. On the whole, however, the deliberate choice of conventionalized language patterns for a play of artificial atmosphere is an interesting experiment. As for the critics, they are forever complaining that nothing new crosses their paths, yet when something new does come, they grumble and compare the new with something old which it does not resemble. Mr. William Archer, who has spent many years in teaching us all how to write plays, has achieved success in the most difficult, technically, of all fields, melodrama. Let us turn back and read Playmaking. Melodrama is difficult because no one can write a good melodrama unless he allows himself to be swept along by his own story. You must believe yourself. You must not condescend to melodrama. The Green Goddess, with the incomparably suave villainy of Mr. George Arliss, is a rattling good story. It is as old as the Vedantic hymns, and all the more satisfying for that reason. Once a year, all good playgoers should be rewarded by seeing one excellent melodrama. It clears the head. The most comfortable position in the theater is to sit a whole evening on the edge of your chair. See Mr. Arliss and you will do this is more to say this month than there is room to say L it in. Our Broadway season has finally arrived at a stirring climax. In passing, I may do little more this month than refer to St. John Irvine's mixed marriage and to Johann Sigurd Johnson's Event of the Hills. The latter is an Icelandic drama in an 18th century setting. It is gloomy, possibly morbid, but of undeniable interest. There are other plays worth dropping in to see, but further comment must be left for another time, and the future likewise holds a promise, that of John Drinkwater's Mary Stewart. In short, drama seems to be once more on its feet in New York. End of Broadway Comes Back by Jack Crawford From the Drama, Volume 11, 1921-1922 The Voice of the City by O. Henry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. The Voice of the City by O. Henry. Twenty five years ago, the school children used to chant their lessons. The manner of their delivery was a singing recitative between the utterance of an Episcopal minister and the drone of a tired sawmill. I mean no disrespect. We must have lumber and sawdust. I remember one beautiful and instructive little lyric that emanated from the physiology class. The most striking line of it was this. The shin bone is the longest bone in the human body. What an inestimable boon it would have been if all the corporeal and spiritual facts pertaining to man had thus been tunefully and logically inculcated in our youthful minds. But what we gained in anatomy, music, and philosophy was meagre. The other day I became confused. I needed a ray of light. I had turned back to those school days for aid. But in all the nasal harmonies we wind forth from those hard benches i could not recall one that treated of the voice of agglomerated mankind in other words of the composite vocal message of massed humanity in other words of the voice of a big city now the individual voice is not lacking we can understand the song of the poet the ripple of the brook the meaning of the man who wants five dollars until next monday the inscriptions on the tombs of the pharaohs, the language of flowers, the step lively of the conductor, and the prelude of the milk cans at 4 a.m. Certain large-eared ones even assert that they are wise to the vibrations of the tympanum produced by concussion of the air emanating from Mr. H. James. But who can 
comprehend the meaning of the voice of the city. I went out for to see. First, I asked Aurelia. She wore white Swiss and a hat with flowers on it, and ribbons and ends of things fluttered here and there. Tell me, I said stammeringly, for I have no voice of my own, what does this big, er, enormous, er, er, whopping city say? It must have a voice of some kind. Does it ever speak to you? What do you interpret its meaning? It it is a tremendous mass, but it must have a key. Like a Saratoga trunk? asked Aurelia. No, said I. Please do not refer to the lid. I have a fancy that every city has a voice. Each one has something to say to the one who can hear it. What does the big one say to you? All cities, said Aurelia, judiciously, say the same thing. When they get through saying it, there is an echo from Philadelphia. So they are unanimous. Here are four million people, said I, scholastically, compressed upon an island which is mostly lamb surrounded by Wall Street water. The conjunction of so many units into so small a space must result in an identity, or, or rather a homogeneity, that finds its oral expression through a common channel. It is, as you might say, a consensus of translation, concentrating in a crystallized general idea which reveals itself in what may be termed the voice of the city. Can you tell me what it is? Aurelia smiled wonderfully. She sat on the high stoop. A spray of insolent ivy bobbed against her right ear. A ray of impudent moonlight flickered upon her nose. But I was adamant, nickel-plated. I must go and find out, I said. What is the voice of this city? Other cities have voices. It is an assignment. I must have it. New York, I continued in a rising tone, had better not hand me a cigar and say, old man, I can't talk for publication. No other city acts in that way. Chicago says unhesitatingly, I will. I, Philadelphia, says, I should. New Orleans says, I used to. Louisville says, don't care if I do. St. Louis says, excuse me. Pittsburgh says, smoke up. Now, New York, Aurelia smiled. Very well, said I. I must go elsewhere and find out. I went into a palace, tile-floored, cherub-ceilinged, and square with the cop. I put my foot on the brass rail and said to Billy Magnus, the best bartender of, in the diocese, Billy, you've lived in New York a long time. What kind of a song and dance does this old town give you? What I mean is, doesn't the gab of it seem to kind of bunch up and slide over the bar to you in a sort of amalgamated tip that hits off the berg in a kind of an epigram with a dash of bitters and a slice of... Excuse me a minute, said Billy. Somebody's punching the button at the side door. He went away, came back with an empty tin bucket, again vanished with it full, returned and said to me, That was Mame. She rings twice. She likes a glass of beer for supper. Her and the kid. If you ever saw that little skeezix of mine, brace up in his high chair and take his beer and... But say, what was yours? I get kind of excited when I hear them two rings. Was it the baseball score or gin fizz you asked for? Ginger ale, I answered. I walked up to Broadway. I saw a cop on the corner. The cops take kids up, women across, and men in. I went up to him. If I'm not exceeding the spiel limit, I said, let me ask you. You see New York during its vocative hours. It is the function of you and your brother cops to preserve the acoustics of the city. There must be a civic voice that is intelligible to you. At night, during your lonely rounds, you must have heard it. What is the epitome of its turmoil and shouting? What does the city say to you? Friend, said the policeman, spinning his club, it don't say nothing. I get my orders from the man higher up. Say, I guess you're all right. Stand here for a few minutes and keep an eye open for the roundsman. The cop melted into the darkness of the side street. In ten minutes he had returned. Married last Tuesday, he said, half gruffly. You know how they are. 
She comes to that corner at nine every night for a... comes to say hello. I generally manage to be there. Say, what was it you asked me a bit ago? What's doing in the city? Oh, there's a roof garden or two just opened, twelve blocks up. I crossed a crow's foot of streetcar tracks and skirted the edge of an umbrageous park, an artificial Diana, gilded, heroic, poised, wind-ruled, on the tower, shimmered in the clear light of her namesake in the sky. Along came my poet, hurrying, hatted, haired, emitting dactyls, spondees and dactyls. I seized him. Bill, said I, in the magazine he is Cleon. Give me a lift. I'm on assignment to find out the voice of the city. You see, it's a special order. Ordinarily a symposium comprising the views of Henry Clews, John L. Sullivan, Edwin Markham, May Irwin, and Charles Schwab would be about all. But this is a different matter. We want a broad, poetic, mystic vocalization of the city's soul and meaning. You are the very chap to give me a hint. Some years ago a man got at the Niagara Falls and gave us its pitch. The note was about two feet below the lowest G on the piano. Now, you can't put New York into a note unless it's better endorsed than that. But give me an idea of what it would say if it should speak. It is bound to be a mighty and far-reaching utterance. To arrive at it, we must take the tremendous crash of the chords of the day's traffic, the laughter and music of the night, the solemn tones of Dr. Parkhurst, the ragtime, the weeping, the stealthy hum of cab wheels, the shout of the press agent, the tinkle of fountains on the roof gardens, the hullabaloo of the strawberry vendor and the covers of everybody's magazine, the whispers of the lovers in the parks, all these sounds must go into your voice, not combined, but mixed, and of the mixture an essence made, and of the essence an extract, an audible extract, of which one drop shall form the thing we seek. Do you remember, asked the poet, with a chuckle, that California girl we met at Stiver's studio last week? Well, I'm on my way to see her. She repeated that poem of mine, the tribute of spring, word for word. She's the smartest proposition in this town just at present. Say, how does this confounded tie look? I spoiled four before I got one to set right. And the voice that I asked you about? I inquired. Oh, she doesn't sing said Cleon, but you ought to hear her recite my angel of the inshore wind. I passed on. I cornered a newsboy, and he flashed at me prophetic pink papers that outstripped the news by two revolutions of the clock's longest hand. Son, I said, while I pretended to chase coins in my penny pocket, doesn't it sometimes seem to you as if the city ought to be able to talk? All these ups and downs and funny business and queer things happening every day. What would it say, do you think, if it could speak? Quit your kiddin', said the boy. What paper do you want? I ain't got no time to waste. It's Mag's birthday, and I want thirty cents to get her a present. Here was no interpreter of the city's mouthpiece. I bought a paper, and consigned its undeclared treaties, its premeditated murders, and unfought battles to an ash-can. Again I repaired to the park, and sat in the moonshade. I thought and thought, and wondered why none could tell me what I asked for. And then, as swift as light from a fixed star, the answer came to me. I arose and hurried hurried, as so many reasoners must, back around my circle. I knew the answer, and I hugged it in my breast as I flew, fearing lest someone would stop me and demand my secret. Aurelia was still on the stoop. The moon was higher, and the ivy shadows were deeper. I sat at her side, and we watched a little cloud tilt at the drifting moon and go asunder, quite pale and discomfited. And then, wonder of wonders and delight of delights, our hands somehow touched, and our fingers closed together, and did not part. After half an hour, Aurelia said, with that smile of hers, Do you know you haven't spoken a word since you came back? That, said I, nodding wisely, is the voice of the city. End of The Voice of the City by O. Henry
Reverie by George Sang. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reverie by George Sang for the Tales of the Cities compilation. I know of no city in the world where strolling reverie is more agreeable than in Paris. If the poor pedestrian through heat and cold meets innumerable tribulations there, it must also be confessed that in the fine days of spring and autumn, if he knows his own happiness, he is a privileged mortal. For my part, I like to recognize that no vehicle, from the sumptuous equipage to the modest hack, can be compared for sweet and smiling reverie with the pleasure of making use of two good legs on the asphalt or pavement obeying the whim of their proprietor let him who will regret ancient paris my intellectual faculties have never permitted me to know its perimeters although like so many others i have been brought up there to-day what great vistas too straight for the artistic eye, but eminently sure, allow us to go on for a long while with our hands in our pockets, without going astray, and without being forced every moment to consult the officer at the corner, or the affable grocer along the way. It is dangerous, I must confess, to be distrait in the centre of a large city which is not obliged to trouble itself about you, when you do not condescend to take care of yourself." Paris is still far from finding a system of veritable safety that would separate the locomotion of horses from that of human beings, and that would succeed in suppressing, without prejudicing business necessities, those hand-trucks of which I am inclined, in passing, to complain a little. I would dare to maintain that absent-minded people, for the hundred perils that they still run in Paris, benefit by the compensation of a hundred thousand real and intimate joys. Whosoever possesses this precious infirmity of preoccupation will join me in saying that I am not maintaining a paradox. In the atmosphere, in the view, and in the sound of Paris, there is I know not what personal influence that is not to be found elsewhere. Nowhere is the charm characteristic of the temperate climate more delightfully manifested with its moist air, its rose skies, marked or pearly with the most vivid and delicate tints, the brilliant windows of its shops lavish with motley color, its river neither too narrow nor too broad, the soft clearness of its reflections, the easy gait of its population, active and lounging at the same time, its confused noises in which everything is harmonized, every sound, that of the water population, as well as that of the city, having its proportions and distributions wonderfully fortuitous. At Bordeaux, or at Rouen, the voices and movement of the river dominate everything, and one might say that its life is on the water. At Paris, life is everywhere, therefore everything there seems more alive than elsewhere. The new garden, arranged in dales and dotted baskets of exotic flowers, is never anything more than the petit trianon of the classic decadence, and the English garden of the beginning of the present century, perfected in the sense of multiplying the turns and accidental features in order to realize the aspect of natural landscape within a limited space. In our opinion, nothing is less justifiable than that title of landscape garden which nowadays eventually takes unto himself in his provincial town even in the more extensive spaces that paris consecrates to this fiction do not hope to find the charm of nature the smallest nook of the rocks of fontainebleau or of the wooded hill of avoin the slenderest cascade of la gueuse or the least known of the meanderings of the Ange has an aspect, a savour, a penetrating power altogether different from the most sumptuous compositions of our Parisian landscapists. 
if you want to see the garden of the creation do not go to the end of the world there are ten thousand of them in france in spots where nobody is occupied and of which no one has any notion seek and you will find but if you want to see the decorative garden par excellence you have it in paris and let us say at once that it is a ravishing invention it is decoration and nothing else make up your mind to that but adorable and marvellous decoration science and taste have joined hands there make your reverence it is a youthful household the exotic vegetable world which has gradually revealed its treasures to us is beginning to inundate us with its riches every year brings us a series of unknown plants many of which doubtless have already enriched the herbals and troubled the notions of worried classifiers but of whose aspect color shape and life we are ignorant the many conservatories of the city of paris possess a world of marvels which constantly grows and in which skilful and learned horticulturists may become initiated into the secrets of the preservation and reproduction proper to each species study has been given to the temperament of these poor exotics that perpetually vegetated in an artificial heat it has been discovered that some that were reputed delicate possess quite a rustic vigor whilst others more mysterious could not endure under our skies as severe cold as they patiently endured in their native earth but like animals plants are susceptible of education and i doubt not that the time will come when more than one that now has to be coaxed in order to live among us will come to produce fruits or shoots gladly we shall then have gratis before our eyes during every hour of the fine season tropical forms perhaps arborescent ferns that are already easy to transport under glass notwithstanding their respectable age of several hundreds of centuries splendid orchids colossal latanya palms shafts of vegetable columns whose age seems to mount to the age of the flowers of the coal beds sagitated leaves ten meters in length that look as if they had fallen from another planet foliage of such brilliant colors as to eclipse that of the flowers graminacea resembling clouds more than herbs mosses lovelier than the velvet of our looms perfumes unknown to the combinations of industrial chemistry and finally gigantic living plants placed within the reach of everybody let us halt here let us dream a little since having passed our first astonishment and expressed our first admiration our imagination carries us into distant regions into still desert isles and into those unknown solitudes whence the courageous and enthusiastic naturalist has brought us these treasures at the peril of his life with regard to perils we must not speak only of the caprices of the sea of the venom of the rattlesnakes and of the hurtful appetite of savage animals and indigenous cannibals certain of whom are fond of white flesh with tomato sauce the plants themselves sometimes possess more prompt and direct means of defence witness the beautiful nettle that we have seen covered with a natural silvery viscous lye that we may touch but that is provided beneath with purple-coloured hairs of which the slightest contact with the skin causes death be comforted it will not leave its glass prison we therefore wander some thousands of leagues from the peri marceau the rich decoration that environs us cannot long keep up the illusion for us too many diverse regions too many countries differing greatly and far distant from one another have contributed to this ornamentation which presents itself as an artistic resume of creation we necessarily fly from one to another on the wings of intuition and ashamed of the number of things of which we are still ignorant we are seized with the desire to travel in order to learn or to learn in order to travel with pleasure and fruitfulness 
shall we leave the decorative gardens without dreaming about the delightful hydraulic trifles that now play so great a role in our embellishments clarified by the rapid motion the water is always a music and radiance the charm of which art cannot shatter i have seen naturalist artists absolutely furious against these ruinous playthings that pretend to remind them of nature and that they treat as puerile and monstrous counterfeits they said let them bring us the rocky and virtuous wells of tivoli with their whirls of impetuous water or let them give us back the blowing tritons of versailles the hydraulic concerts of the gardens of frascati and all the rococo follies rather than these false grottoes and lying cascades it is falsifying all the notions of the true all the laws of taste and all the sentiment of a generation that they pretend they are making artistic and learned they were indignant and we could not calm them shall we share their anger no between the reality and the accepted between art and nature there is a medium necessary for the sedentary enjoyment of a large majority of people what a number of poor citizens never have and never will see the picturesque sights of spain switzerland and italy and the enchantments of one's own view of the great features of mountain and forest of lake and torrent except through the fictions of our theatres and gardens it is impossible to provide them with real specimens we must limit ourselves to the copy of a detail a nook or an episode i cannot bring you the ocean be content with a reef and a wave this detail would not gain in the least by having its already considerable proportions centupled in cost it would not be more real all that can be demanded of us is to make it pretty and in this respect our hydraulic playthings are without reproach formerly they were much more costly and transported us into a mythological world of marble or bronze which was not more successful in realizing the antique style or the poetry of the grecian gardens and temples they have long formed a separate style entirely fanciful which indeed has its own charm but which we must leave where it is apollo and his nymphs neptune and amphitrite have nothing more to say to us unless they speak to us of louis the fourteenth and his court the thought of our epoch aims at making us love nature romanticism has disembarrassed us of the fetishes that did not allow us to see her to understand her and to love her for herself what we want to teach our children is that grace is in the tree and not in the hamadryad that formerly dwelt in it that the water is as beautiful on the rock as in the marble that the dreadful rock itself has its physiognomy its color and its cherished plant the wreathings of which make a wonderful tapestry for it that the grotto work has no need of symmetry and a clothing of shells it is only a question of imitating with a truth-loving skill their natural dispositions and their monumental easy or fantastic poses later on if our children see how real nature works they will only enjoy her the more and they will remember the grottoes of longchamp monceau and the butte chaumont as we recall with pleasure and tenderness the little frail plant that we cultivate in our window and that we see blowing strong and glorious in our country End of Reverie by The Age for Love by Paul Bourget. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. The Age for Love by Paul Bourget for the Tales of the Cities compilation. 
when i submitted the plan of my inquiry upon the age for love to the editor-in-chief of the boulevard the highest type of french literary paper he seemed astonished that an idea so journalistic that was his word should have been evolved from the brain of his most recent acquisition i had been with him two weeks and it was my first contribution give me some details my dear labarth he said in a somewhat less insolent manner than was his wont after listening to me for a few moments he continued that is good you will go and interview certain men and women first upon the age at which one loves the most next upon the age when one is most loved is that your idea and now to whom will you go first i have prepared a list i replied and took from my pocket a sheet of paper i had jotted down the names of a number of celebrities whom i proposed to interview on this all-important question and i began to read over my list it contained two ex-government officials a general a dominican father four actresses two cafe concert singers four actors two financiers two lawyers a surgeon and a lot of literary celebrities at some of the names my chief would nod his approval at others he would say curtly with an affectation of american manners bad strike it off until i came to the name i had kept for the last that of pierre fauchery the famous novelist strike that off he said shrugging his shoulders he is not on good terms with us and yet i suggested is there any one whose opinion would be of greater interest to reading men as well as to women i had even thought of beginning with him the devil you had interrupted the editor-in-chief it is one of fauchery's principles not to see any reporters i have sent him ten if i have one and he has shown them all the door the boulevard does not relish such treatment so we have given him some pretty hard hits nevertheless i will have an interview with fauchery for the boulevard was my reply i am sure of it if you succeed he replied i'll raise your salary that man makes me tired with his scorn of newspaper notoriety he must take his share of it like the rest but you will not succeed what makes you think you can permit me to tell you my reason later in forty-eight hours you will see whether i have succeeded or not go and do not spare the fellow decidedly i had made some progress as a journalist even in my two weeks apprenticeship if i could permit pascal to speak in this way of the man i most admired among living writers since that not far distant time when tired of being poor i had made up my mind to cast my lot with the multitude in paris i had tried to lay aside my old self as lizards do their skin and i had almost succeeded in a former time a former time that was but yesterday i knew for in a drawer full of poems dramas and half-finished tales i had proof of it that there had once existed a certain jules labarthe who had come to paris with the hope of becoming a great man that person believed in literature with a capital l in the ideal another capital in glory a third capital he was now dead and buried would he some day his position assured began to write once more from pure love of his art possibly but for the moment i knew only the energetic practical labarthe who had joined the procession with the idea of getting into the front rank and of obtaining as soon as possible an income of thirty thousand francs a year what would it matter to this second individual if that vile pascal should boast of having stolen a march on the most delicate the most powerful of the heirs of balzac since i the new labarthe was capable of looking forward to an operation which required about as much delicacy as some of the performances of my editor-in-chief i had as a matter of fact a sure means of obtaining the interview it was this when i was young and simple i had sent some verses and stories to pierre fauchery 
the same verses and stories, the refusal of which, by four editors, had finally made me decide to enter the field of journalism. The great writer was traveling at this time, but he had replied to me. I had responded by a letter, to which he again replied, this time with an invitation to call upon him. I went. I did not find him. I went again. I did not find him that time. Then a sort of timidity prevented my returning to the charge. So I had never met him. He knew me only as the young Ilya of my two epistles. This is what I counted upon to extort from him the favor of an interview which he certainly would refuse to a mere newspaper man. My plan was simple, to present myself at his house, to be received, to conceal my real occupation, to sketch vaguely a subject for a novel in which there should occur a discussion upon the age for love, to make him talk, and then when he should discover his conversation in print, here I began to feel some remorse, but I stifled it with the terrible phrase, the struggles for life, and also by the recollection of numerous examples culled from the firm with which I now had the honor of being connected. The morning after I had had this very literary conversation with my honorable director, I rang at the door of the small house in the Rue de Bord Valmore, where Pierre Fauchery lived, in a retired corner of Passy. Having taken up my pen to tell a plain, unvarnished tale, I do not see how I can conceal the wretched feeling of pleasure which, as I rang the bell, warmed my heart at the thought of the good joke I was about to play on the owner of this peaceful abode. Even after making up one's mind to the sacrifices I had decided upon, there is always left a trace of envy for those who have triumphed in the melancholy struggle for literary supremacy. It was a real disappointment to me when the servant replied, ill-humouredly, that Monsieur Fauchery was not in Paris. I asked when he would return. The servant did not know. I asked for his address. The servant did not know that. Poor Lion, who thought he had secured an anonymity for his holiday. A half hour later, I had discovered that he was staying for the present at the Chateau de Probé, near Nemours. I had merely had to make inquiries of his publisher. Two hours later, I bought my ticket at the Gare de Lyon for the little town chosen by Balzac. As the scene for his delicious story of Ursule Mirouet, I took a traveling bag and was prepared to spend the night there. In case I failed to see the master that afternoon, I had decided to make sure of him the next morning. Exactly seven hours after the servant, faithful to his trust, had declared that he did not know where his master was staying, I was standing in the hall of the chateau, waiting for my card to be sent up. I had taken care to write on it a reminder of our conversation of the year before, and this time, after a ten-minute wait in the hall, during which I noticed with singular curiosity and malice two very elegant and very pretty young women going out for a walk. I was admitted to his presence. Aha! I said to myself, this then is the secret of his exile. The interview promises well. The novelist received me in a cosy little room, with a window opening onto the park, already beginning to turn yellow with the advancing autumn. A wood fire burned in the fireplace and lighted up the walls, which were hung with flowered cretonne, and on which could be distinguished several colored English prints representing cross-country rides and the jumping of hedges. Here was the worldly environment with which Fauchery is so often reproached, but the books and papers that littered the table bore witness that the present occupant of this charming retreat remained a substantial man of letters. His habit of constant work was still further attested by his face, which, I admit, gave me all at once a feeling of remorse for the trick I was about to play him. If I had found him the snobbish pretender whom the weekly newspapers were in the habit of ridiculing, it would have been a delight to outwit his diplomacy. But no, I saw, as he put down his pen to receive me, a man about fifty-seven years old with a face that bore the marks of reflection, 
eyes tired from sleeplessness, a brow heavy with thought, who said as he pointed to an easy chair, You will excuse me, my dear confrere, for keeping you waiting. I, his dear confrere, ah, if he had known! You see, and he pointed to the page still wet with ink, that man cannot be free from the slavery of furnishing copy. One has less facility at my age than at yours. Now let us speak of yourself. How do you happen to be at Nemours? What have you been doing since the story and the verses you were kind enough to send me? It is vain to try to sacrifice once for all one's youthful ideals. When a man has loved literature as I loved it at twenty, he cannot be satisfied at twenty-six to give up his early passion, even at the bidding of implacable necessity. So Pierre Faucheret remembered my poor verses. He had actually read my story. His illusion proved it. Could I tell him at such a moment that since the creation of those first works I had despaired of myself, and that I had changed my gun to the other shoulder? The image of the boulevard office rose suddenly before me. I heard the voice of the editor-in-chief saying, Interview, Fauchery, you will never accomplish that. So, faithful to my self-imposed role, I replied, I have retired to Nemours to work upon a novel called The Age for Love, and it is on this subject that I wish to consult you, my dear master. It seemed to me, it may possibly have been an illusion, that at the announcement of the so-called title of my so-called novel, a smile and a shadow flitted over Fauchery's eyes and mouth. A vision of the two young women I had met in the hall came back to me. Was the author of so many great masterpieces of analysis about to live a new book before writing it? I had no time to answer this question, for, with a glance at an onyx vase containing some cigarettes of Turkish tobacco, he offered me one, lighted one himself, and began first to question, then to reply to me. I listened while he thought aloud, and had almost forgotten my Machiavellian combination. So keen was my relish of the joyous intimacy of this communion with a mind I had passionately loved in his works. He was the first of the great writers of our day, whom I had thus approached on something like terms of intimacy. As we talked, I observed the strange similarity between his spoken and his written words. I admired the charming simplicity with which he abandoned himself to the pleasures of imagination, his superabundant intelligence, the liveliness of his impressions, and his total absence of arrogance and of pose. There is no such thing as an age for love, he said in substance, because the man capable of loving, in the complex and modern sense of love as a sort of ideal exaltation, never ceases to love. I will go further. He never ceases to love the same person. You know the experiment that a contemporary physiologist tried with a series of portraits to determine in what the indefinable resemblances called family likeness consisted? He took photographs of twenty persons of the same blood. Then he photographed these photographs on the same plate, one over the other. In this way he discovered the common features which determined the type. Well, I am convinced that if we could try a similar experiment and photograph one upon another the pictures of the different women whom the same man has loved or thought he had loved in the course of his life, we should discover that all these women resembled one another. The most inconsistent have cherished one and the same being through five or six or even twenty different embodiments. The main point is to find out at what age they have met the woman who approaches nearest to the one whose image they have constantly borne within themselves. For them, that would be the age for love. The age for being loved? He continued. The deepest of all the passions I have ever known a man to inspire was in the case of one of my masters, a poet, and he was sixty years old at the time. It is true that he still held himself as erect as a young man. He came and went with a step as light as yours. He conversed like Rivarol. He composed verses as beautiful as de Venise. He was, besides, very poor, very lonely, and very unhappy. 
having lost one after another, his wife and his children. You remember the words of Shakespeare's Moore? She loved me for the dangers I had passed, and I loved her that she did pity them. So it was that this great artist, inspired in a beautiful, noble, and wealthy young Russian woman, a devotion so passionate that because of him she never married. She found a way to take care of him, day and night, in spite of his family, during his last illness, and at the present time, having bought from his heirs all of the poet's personal belongings, she keeps the apartment where he lived, just as it was at the time of his death. That was years ago. In her case, she found in a man three times her own age the person who corresponded to a certain ideal which she carried in her heart. Look at Goethe, at Lamartine, and at many others. To depict feelings on this high plane, you must give up the process of minute and insignificant observation, which is the bane of the artists of today. In order that a sixty-year-old lover should appear neither ridiculous nor odious, you must apply to him what the elder Corneille so proudly said of himself in his lines to the Marquise. Cependant, j'ai quelque charme qui sont assez éclatants pour ne voir pas trop de larmes de ces ravages du temps. Have the courage to analyze great emotions to create characters who shall be lofty and true. The whole art of the analytical novel lies there. As he spoke, the master had such a light of intellectual certainty in his eyes that to me he seemed the embodiment of one of those great characters he had been urging me to describe. It made me feel that the theory of this man, himself almost a sexagenarian, that at any age one may inspire love, was not unreasonable. The contrast between the world of ideas in which he moved and the atmosphere of the literary shop in which, for the last few months, I had been stifling was too strong. The dreams of my youth were realized in this man whose gifts remained unimpaired after the production of thirty volumes, and whose face, growing old, was a living illustration of the beautiful saying, Since we must wear out, let us wear out nobly. His slender figure bespoke the austerity of long hours of work. His firm mouth showed his decision of character. His brow, with its deep furrows, had the paleness of the paper over which he so often bent, and yet the refinement of his hands, so well cared for, the sober elegance of his dress, and an aristocratic air that was natural to him, showed that the finer professional virtues had been cultivated in the midst of a life of frivolous temptations. These temptations had been no more of a disturbance to his ethical and spiritual nature than the academic honors, the financial successes, the numerous additions that had been his. Withal, he was an awfully good fellow, for, after having talked at great length with me, he ended by saying, Since you are staying in Nemours, I hope to see you often, and today I cannot let you go without presenting you to my hostess. What could I say? This was the way in which a mere reporter on the boulevard found himself installed at a five o'clock tea table in the salon of a chateau, where surely no newspaper man had ever before set foot, and was presented as a young poet and novelist of the future to the old Marquise de Proby, whose guest the master was. This amiable white-haired dowager questioned me upon my alleged work, and I replied equivocally with blushes, which the good lady must have attributed to bashful timidity. Then, as though some evil genius had conspired to multiply the witnesses of my bad conduct, the two young women, whom I had seen in going out, returned in the midst of my unlooked-for visit. Ah, my interview with this student of femininity, upon the age for love, was about to have a living commentary. How it would illumine his words to hear him conversing with these new arrivals! One was a young girl of possibly twenty, a Russian, if I rightly understood the name. She was rather tall, with a long face lighted up by two very gentle black eyes, singular in their fire and intensity. 
she bore a striking resemblance to the portrait attributed to Francia in the Salon Carré of the Louvre, which goes by the name of the man in black, because the color of his clothes and his mantle. About her mouth and nostrils was that same subdued nervousness, that same restrained feverishness, which gives to the portrait its striking qualities. I had not been there a quarter of an hour before I had guessed from the way she watched and listened to Fauchery what a passionate interest the old master inspired in her. When he spoke, she paid rapt attention. When she spoke to him, I felt her voice shiver, if I may use the word, and he, he, glorious writer, surfeited with triumphs, exhausted by his labors, seemed, as soon as he felt the radiance of her glance of ingenuous idolatry, to recover that vivacity, that elasticity of impression, which is the sovereign grace of youthful lovers. "'I understand now why he cited Goethe and the young girl of Marienbad,' said I to myself with a laugh, as my hired carriage sped on toward Nemours. He was thinking of himself. He is in love with that child, and she is in love with him. We shall hear of his marrying her. There's a wedding that will call forth copy, and when Pascal hears that I witness the courtship, but just now I must think of my interview. Won't Fauchery be surprised to read it? day after to-morrow in his paper but does he read the papers it may not be right but what harm will it do him besides it's a part of the struggle for life it was by such reasoning i remember the reasoning of a man determined to arrive that i tried to lull to sleep the inward voice that cried you have no right to put on paper to give to the public what this noble writer said to you supposing that he was receiving a poet not a reporter but I heard also the voice of my chief saying, You will never succeed. And this second voice, I am ashamed to confess, triumphed over the other with all the more ease because I was obliged to do something to kill time. I reached Nemours too late for the train, which would have brought me back to Paris about dinner time. At the old inn they gave me a room which was clean and quiet, a good place to write, so I spent the evening until bedtime composing the first of the articles which were to form my inquiry. I scribbled away under the vivid impressions of the afternoon, my powers as well as my nerves spurred by a touch of remorse. Yes, I scribbled four pages which would have been no disgrace to the journal de Goncourt, that exquisite manual of the perfect reporter. It was all there, my journey, my arrival at the chateau, a sketch of the quaint eighteenth-century building, with its fringe of trees and its well-kept walks, the master's room, the master himself and his conversation, the tea at the end, and the smile of the old novelist in the midst of a circle of admirers, old and young. It lacked only a few closing lines. I will add these in the morning, I thought, and went to bed with a feeling of duty performed. Such is the nature of a writer. Under the form of an interview, I had done, and I knew it, the best work of my life. What happens while we sleep? Is there, unknown to us, a secret and irresistible ferment of ideas while our senses are closed to the impressions of the outside world? Certain it is that on awakening I am apt to find myself in a state of mind very different from that in which I went to sleep. I had not been awake ten minutes before the image of Pierre Fauchery came up before me, and at the same time the thought that I had taken a base advantage of the kindness of his reception of me became quite unbearable. I felt a passionate longing to see him again, to ask his pardon for my deception. I wished to tell him who I was, with what purpose I had gone to him, and that I regretted it. But there was no need of a confession. It would be enough to destroy the pages I had written the night before. With this idea, I arose. Before tearing them up, I reread them. And then, any writer will understand me. And then, they seemed to me so brilliant that I did not tear them up. Fauchery is so intelligent, so generous, was the thought that crossed my mind. What is there in this interview, after all, to offend him? Nothing, absolutely nothing. Even if I should go to him again this very morning and tell him my story, and that, upon the success of my little inquiry, 
my whole future as a journalist might depend when he found that i had had five years of poverty and hard work without accomplishing anything and that i had had to go on to a paper in order to earn the very bread i ate he would pardon me he would pity me and he would say publish your interview yes but what if he should forbid my publishing it but no he would not do that i passed the morning in considering my latest plan a certain shyness made it very painful to me but it might at the same time conciliate my delicate scruples my amour propre as an ambitious chronicler and the interests of my pocket-book i knew that pascal had the name of being very generous with an interview article if it pleased him and besides had he not promised me a reward if i succeeded with fauchery in short i had decided to try my experiment when after a hasty breakfast i saw on stepping into the carriage i had had the night before a victoria with coat of arms drive rapidly past and was stunned at recognizing fauchery himself apparently lost in a gloomy reverie that was in singular contrast to his high spirits of the night before a small trunk on the coachman's seat was a sufficient indication that he was going to the station the train for paris left in twelve minutes time enough for me to pack my things pell-mell into my valise and hurriedly to pay my bill the same carriage which was to have taken me to the chateau de Proubet carried me to the station at full speed and when the train left i was seated in an empty compartment opposite the famous writer who was saying to me you too deserting nemours like me you work best in paris the conversation begun in this way might easily have led to the confession i had resolved to make but in the presence of my unexpected companion i was seized with an unconquerable shyness moreover he inspired me with a curiosity which was quite equal to my shyness any number of circumstances from a telegram from a sick relative to the most commonplace matter of business might have explained his sudden departure from the chateau where i had left him so comfortably installed the night before but that the expression of his face should have changed as it had that in eighteen hours he should have become the careworn discouraged being he now seemed when i had left him so pleased with life so happy so assiduous in his attentions to that pretty girl mademoiselle de Rousset, who loved him and whom he seemed to love was a mystery which took complete possession of me this time without any underlying professional motive he was to give me the key before we reached paris at any rate i shall always believe that part of his conversation was in an indirect way a confidence he was still unstrung by the unexpected incident which had caused both his hasty departure and the sudden metamorphosis in what he himself if he had been writing would have called his intimate heaven the story he told me was pers vargas as bale loved to say his idea was that i would not discover the real hero i shall always believe that it was his own story under another name and i love to believe it because it was so exactly his way of looking at things it was apropos of the supposed subject of my novel oh irony apropos of the real subject of my interview that he began i have been thinking about our conversation and about your book and i am afraid that i expressed myself badly yesterday when i said that one may love and be loved at any age i ought to have added that sometimes this love comes too late it comes when one no longer has the right to prove to the loved one how much she is loved except by love's sacrifice i should like to share with you a human document as they say to-day which is in itself a drama with a denouement but i must ask you not to use it for the secret is not my own with the assurance of my discretion he went on i had a friend a companion of my own age who when he was twenty had loved a young girl he was poor she was rich her family separated them the girl married someone else and almost immediately afterward she died my friend lived 
some day you will know for yourself that it is almost as true to say that one recovers from all things as that there is nothing which does not leave its scar i had been the confidant of his serious passion and i became the confidant of the various affairs that followed that first ineffaceable disappointment he felt he inspired other loves he tasted other joys he endured other sorrows and yet when we were alone and when we touched upon those confidences that come from the heart's depths the girl who was the ideal of his twentieth year reappeared in his words how many times he has said to me in others i have always looked for her and as i have never found her i have never truly loved any one but her and had she loved him i interrupted he did not think so replied fauchery at least she had never told him so well you must now imagine my friend at my age or almost there you must picture him growing gray tired of life and convinced that he had at last discovered the secret of peace at this time he met while visiting some relatives in a country house a mere girl of twenty who was the image the haunting image of her whom he had hoped to marry thirty years before it was one of those strange resemblances which extend from the color of the eyes to the timbre of the voice from the smile to the thought from the gestures to the finest feelings of the heart i could not in a few disjointed phrases describe to you the strange emotions of my friend it would take pages and pages to make you understand the tenderness both present and at the same time retrospective for the dead through the living the hypnotic condition of the soul which does not know where dreams and memories end and present feeling begins the daily commingling of the most unreal thing in the world the phantom of a lost love with the freshest the most actual the most irresistibly naive and spontaneous thing in it a young girl she comes she goes she laughs she sings you go about with her in the intimacy of country life and at her side walks one long dead after two weeks of almost careless abandon to the dangerous delights of this inward agitation imagine my friend entering by chance one morning one of the less frequented rooms of the house a gallery where among other pictures hung a portrait of himself painted when he was twenty-five he approaches the portrait abstractedly there had been a fire in the room so that a slight moisture dimmed the glass which protected the pastel and on this glass because of this moisture he sees distinctly the trace of two lips which had been placed upon the eyes of the portrait two small delicate lips the sight of which makes his heart beat he leaves the gallery questions a servant who tells him that no one but the young woman he has in mind has been in the room that morning what then i asked as he paused my friend returned to the gallery looked once more at the adorable imprint of the most innocent the most passionate of caresses a mirror hung near by where he could compare his present with his former face the man he was with the man he had been he never told me and i never asked what his feelings were at that moment did he feel that he was too culpable to have inspired a passion in a young girl whom he would have been a fool almost a criminal to marry did he comprehend that through his age which was so apparent it was his youth which this child loved did he remember with a keenness that was all too sad that other who had never given him a kiss like that at a time when he might have returned it i only know that he left the same day determined never again to see one whom he could no longer love as he had loved the other with the hope the purity the soul of a man of twenty a few hours after this conversation i found myself once more in the office of the boulevard seated in pascal's den and he was saying already have you accomplished your interview with pierre faucheret he would not even receive me i replied boldly what did i tell you 
he sneered, shrugging his big shoulders. We'll get even with him on his next volume. But you know, Labarth, as long as you continue to have that innocent look about you, you can't expect to succeed in newspaper work. I bore with the ill-humor of my chief. What would he have said if he had known that I had in my pocket an interview, and in my head an anecdote, which were material for a most successful story? And he has never had either the interview or the story. Since then I have made my way in the line where he said I should fail. I have lost my innocent look, and I earn my thirty thousand francs a year, and more. I have never had the same pleasure in the printing of the most profitable, the most brilliant article that I had in consigning to oblivion the sheets relating my visit to Nemours. I often think that I have not served the cause of letters as I wanted to, since, with all my laborious work, I have never written a book. And yet, when I recall the irresistible impulse of respect which prevented me from committing toward a dearly loved master a most profitable but infamous indiscretion, I say to myself, if you have not served the cause of letters, you have not betrayed it. And this is the reason now that Fauchery is no longer of this world, that it seems to me that the time has come for me to relate my first interview. There is none of which I am more proud. End of The Age for Love by Paul Bourget A Day in London by Theophile Gautier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. A Day in London by Theophile Gautier for the Tales of the Cities compilation. After leaving Gravesend, the lower boundary of the port of London, stores, warehouses, and yards crowd together and mass with quite a picturesque irregularity. To the left rise the two cupolas of the Royal Naval Hospital, Greenwich, through the open colonnade of which we catch a glimpse of park depths with great trees, producing a charming effect. Seated on the steps of the peristyle, the invalids watch the departure and arrival of the ships that form the subject of their souvenirs and conversations, and the sharp scent of the sea again delights their nostrils. Sir Christopher Wren was the architect of this fine building. Greenwich faces the Isle of Dogs, which, however, is not completely an island, but lies in a loop of the Thames, of which skilful use has been made. It is here that the West India Company has excavated its docks. The East India docks, much smaller and less frequented, are to the right, a little higher up, and at the extremity of the curve made by the river. The West India docks are something enormous, gigantic, fabulous, and almost beyond human proportions. They are the work of cyclops and titans. Above the tops of the houses, shops, embankments, flights of steps, and all the hybrid constructions that line the banks of the river, you see a prodigious forest of ship's masts extending to infinity, an inextricable mass of rigging, spars, and cordage that by the density of their lacing would shame the most fibrous bine-weeds of an American virgin forest. Here it is that are built, refitted, and repaired that innumerable army of vessels that go out in search of the riches of the world in order afterwards to pour them into that bottomless gulf of misery and luxury called London. The West India docks can hold three hundred vessels. A canal, dug parallel with the docks, cutting through the Isle of Dogs and called the City Canal, shortens the distance it would take to double the point by three or four miles. The commercial docks on the opposite bank, the London docks and the St. Catherine docks just below the tower, are no less wonderful. In the commercial docks, are the biggest cellars in the world. The wines of Spain and Portugal are stored there. Besides these, there are private docks and basins. Each instant, amid a group of houses, you see a ship take up position. The yards, 
put out the eyes of the windows. The spars penetrate into the rooms, and the cutwaters seem to be making breaches in the doors of the shops, like ancient battering rams. The houses and ships live in the most touching and cordial intimacy. At high tide the yards become basins and receive ships. Flights of steps, slips constructed of stone, granite, and brick, mount and descend from the river to the houses. London has her arms plunged into her river up to the elbows. A regular quay would obstruct the familiarity between the river and the city. This is a gain in picturesqueness, for nothing is more horrible than those eternal straight lines, prolonged in spite of everything, with which modern civilization is so stupidly infatuated. England is only a dockyard. London is only a port. The sea is the natural fatherland of the English. They take such delight in it that many of their great lords spend their lives in making the most dangerous voyages in little vessels equipped and managed by themselves. The Yacht Club has no other aim than to encourage and favor this taste. The land is so unpleasing to them that they have a hospital stationed in the middle of the Thames in a great hulk which serves the sailors who are ill in the port of London. The fronts of all these houses are turned towards the river, for the Thames is London's great highway, the artery from which the veins branch to carry life and circulation into the body of the city. Therefore, what a riot of inscriptions and signs! Letters of all colors and sizes cover the edifices from top to bottom. The characters often reach the height of one story. The houses, thus streaked, placarded, and variegated with lettering, when seen from the middle of the Thames, present the most outlandish appearance. I was not a little surprised to see the tower intact. It has lost nothing of its ancient physiognomy. It is still there, with its high walls, its sinister attitude, and its low arch, the Traitor's Gate, under which a black boat, more sinister than Charon's bark, brought criminals in, and came to carry the condemned away to death. The tower is not, as its name would seem to indicate, a donjon or solitary belfry. It is a regular Bastille, a cluster of towers connected by walls, a fortress surrounded by moats supplied by the Thames, with cannons and drawbridges, a fortress of the Middle Ages, at least as serious as our Vincennes, containing a chapel, a treasury, an arsenal, and a thousand other curiosities. We were approaching the end of our voyage. A few more turns of the wheel, and the steamboat touched the Custom House Quay, where the passengers' trunks would not be examined till the morrow, for in London Sunday is observed as scrupulously as the Sabbath by the Jews in Jerusalem. I shall never forget the magnificent spectacle presented to my eyes. The big arches of London Bridge reached across the river with their five great limbs and stood out somberly against a background of setting sun. The disk, fiery like a shield reddened in a furnace, was sinking exactly behind the central arch, which traced a black segment of incomparable boldness and vigor above the orb. A long trail of fire scintillated and trembled upon the rippling waves. Violet smoke and mist bathed space as far as Southwark Bridge, the vaguely sketched arches of which were scarcely perceptible. To the right, a little in the background, flamed the gilded bronze of the summit of the tall column erected to commemorate the fire of 1666. To the left, the belfry of St. Clive, projected above the roofs, monumental chimney stacks that might be taken for votive columns of Ionic or Doric capitals, were they not in the habit of vomiting smoke, in a most happy manner, broke the horizon lines, and accentuated the orange and pale lemon tints of the sky with their strong tones. On turning round, behind you, is a red naval city, with quarters and streets of vessels, for it is at this, the first of the London bridges, that ships stop. We disembarked. When the cab was rapidly rolling through the streets between the Custom House and High Holborn, I looked out of the window 
and was greatly astonished at the solitude and profound silence that reigned. You might have called it a dead town, one of those cities inhabited by people turned to stone that oriental stories tell of. All the shops were shut, and no human face appeared at the windows. Occasionally a rare figure passed along the walls like a shadow. This doleful and deserted aspect so strongly contrasted with the idea of noise and animation that I had formed of London that I could not get over my surprise, till at length I remembered that it was Sunday. And the London Sunday had been held up to me as the ideal of weariness. On that day, which with us, at least for the common people, is a day of joy, promenade, dress, feasting, and dancing, on the other side of the channel is spent in inconceivable sadness. The taverns close at midnight on Saturday. The theatres do not open. The shops are hermetically shut up, and it would be very difficult for a man to get anything to eat unless he has made provision beforehand. Life seems to be suspended. The machinery of London ceases to work, like the wheels of a clock when you put your finger on the pendulum. For fear of profaning dominical solemnity, London does not dare to move. It will scarcely allow itself even to breathe. On that day, after having listened to the pastor of the sect in which he belongs, every good Englishman shuts himself up within the walls of his house to meditate on the Bible, to offer his weariness to God, and to enjoy in front of a big coal fire the happiness of being at home, and of being neither a Frenchman nor a Papist, a source of inexhaustible bliss. At midnight the charm is broken. Circulation, that had stopped for a moment, starts again. The houses lie open. Life returns to this great body that had fallen into lethargy. The Dominical Lazarus is resuscitated at the brazen voice of Monday, and resumes its march. The shops are slow to open. Paris gets up earlier than London. It is not till about 10 a.m. that London begins to awake. It is true that it goes to bed much later. Since the occupants are not yet up, let us take note of the dwellings. Let us describe the nest before the bird. The English houses have no port cochins, and scarcely any have a courtyard. An area with railings separates them from the path. In this basement, the kitchen offices are placed. Coal, bread, meat brought on a kind of hollowed plank, and all provisions go in that way without causing the master any inconvenience. The stables are generally in separate buildings, sometimes at some distance. Brick is the ordinary basis of construction. English bricks are usually yellow ochre in hue, which, in my opinion, cannot compare with the red and warm tones of our own. Houses built of bricks of this color have a sickly and unwholesome appearance that is disagreeable to the eye. There are rarely more than three stories, and these have only two or three windows each, for generally a house is occupied by only one family. A flight of white stone steps, thrown like a drawbridge over the moat leading to the kitchen offices, connects the house with the street, and the door, painted like oak, is often adorned with a brass plate on which are written the name and quality of the owner. Such are the characteristic features of the real English house. What gives quite an individual aspect to London, in addition to the width of its streets and the lowness of its houses, is the uniformly black hue that covers everything. Nothing is sadder or more lugubrious, for this black possesses nothing of the brown and strong tints that time gives to old buildings in more southern climes. It is an imperceptible and subtle grime that clings to everything, penetrates everywhere, and from which nothing can protect itself. You would say that all the monuments were powdered with black lead. The immense quantity of coal consumed in London in warming houses and in furnaces is one of the chief causes of this general mourning of the edifices, the most ancient of which have literally the appearance of having been painted with blacking. This effect is particularly noticeable in the statues. Newgate Prison, with its 
bossages and worm-eaten stones, the old church of St. Saviour, and some Gothic chapels, the names of which I forget, seem to have been built of black granite, rather than to have been darkened by the years. This prevailing hue would suffice to explain the traditional spleen of the English. The dome of St. Paul's, a heavy counterfeit of St. Peter's, Rome, an edifice of the family of the Pantheon and the Escurist, with its humped cupola and two square belfries, cruelly suffers from the influence of the London atmosphere. Notwithstanding the efforts to keep it white, it is always black, at least on one side. It is vain to coat it with paint, the imperceptible carbon, in solution in the fog, works quicker than the painter's brush. St. Paul's is an additional example to prove that the cupola is a form that belongs to the east, and that the skies of the north require to be cut by the needles and sharp angles of Gothic architecture. The London sky, even when it is unclouded, is of a milky blue in which grey predominates. The azure is sensibly paler than that of the sky of France. There, the evenings and mornings are always bathed in mists and drowned in vapours. London steams in the sun like a sweating horse or a boiling cauldron, and this produces in open spaces those admirable effects of light so well rendered by the English watercolorists and engravers. In the finest weather, it is difficult clearly to see Southwark Bridge from London Bridge, which, however, are not far apart. This mist that overspreads all, softens all harsh angles, veils the poverty of construction, enlarges the perspective, and gives mystery and vagueness to the most aggressive objects. By its means, a factory chimney easily becomes an obelisk. A shop of mean architecture assumes the air of a Babylonian terrace, and a pitiful row of columns changes into a palmarine portico. The symmetrical aridity of civilization and the vulgarity of the forms she makes use of are softened or disappear entirely thanks to this beneficent veil. The streets were becoming animated. Laborers, with white aprons tied at the waist, were on their way to work. Butcher boys were carrying meat in their wooden troughs. Carriages were passing with the rapidity of lightning. Omnibuses, brilliant with color and varnish, bedizened with gold letters announcing their destinations, followed one another with scarcely an interval, with passengers outside and conductors standing on a ledge beside the door. These omnibuses travel very fast, for London is so vast, so enormous a city, that there the need of rapidity makes itself felt more keenly than in Paris. This activity of locomotion is in strange contrast with the impassive air, and the phlegmatic and cold physiognomy, to say nothing more, of all these imperturbable passengers. The English move quickly like the dead in the ballad, and you cannot read any desire of arriving in their eyes. They run, and they do not seem to be in a hurry. They always go straight ahead like a cannon-ball, do not turn round when jostled, and do not beg pardon when they jostle anyone else. Even the women walk with a quick step that would do honor to grenadiers marching to the assault, and with that geometrical and manly gait by which an Englishwoman is recognized on the continent, and which excites the laughter of the Parisian child. The children, even, make haste on their way to school. The Thames is to London what the boulevard is to Paris, the principal line of circulation. Only on the Thames the omnibuses are replaced by little steamboats. Nothing is more delightful than these little voyages that cause to defile past you, like a moving panorama, the picturesque banks of the river. You thus pass all the bridges of London. You can admire the three iron arches of Southwark Bridge, so bold in strut, so wide in extent the ionic columns that give such an elegant appearance to Blackfriars Bridge, and the Doric pillars of such robust and solid shape of Waterloo Bridge, surely the finest in the world. On leaving Waterloo Bridge, 
through the arches of blackfriars bridge you see the gigantic silhouette of st paul's rising above an ocean of roofs among the spires and belfries of st marlebone st benet and st matthew with a portion of a quay thronged with boats barks and storehouses from westminster bridge you discover the ancient abbey of that name lifting into the haze its two lofty square towers that recall the towers of the notre dame in paris and that have a sharp turret at each angle and the three strange open-work belfries of st john the evangelist without counting the saw-teeth formed by the spires of distant chapels the factory chimneys and the house roofs vauxhall bridge worthily ends the perspective forgive me if i am always talking of the thames but its ceaselessly moving panorama is something so novel and so impressive that it is hard to get away from it a forest of three masters in the heart of a capital is the finest spectacle that human industry can present to the view starting from waterloo bridge we will reach the strand by wellington street and walk along it from the pretty little church of st mary so singularly situated in the middle of the street the strand which is quite wide is decked on both sides by sumptuous and splendid shops which though not possessing perhaps the coquettish elegance of those of paris yet have an air of wealth and luxurious abundance here we find displayed stocks of prints in which we can admire the masterpieces of the english graver so supple so soft so suggestive of color and unhappily employed upon the worst designs in the world regent street which has arcades like the rue de rivoli piccadilly pall mall haymarket the italian opera which may best be compared with the odeon in paris carlton place and st james park the queen's palace with its triumphant arch imitated from that of the carousel rendered this part of the city one of the most brilliant in london the architecture of the houses or rather of the palaces that constitute this district occupied by the wealthy classes is altogether impressive and monumental although of a hybrid and often equivocal composition never have there been so many columns and pediments even in an antique city surely the greeks and romans were never so greek or roman as the subjects of his britannic majesty you walk between two rows of parthenons that is flattering you see nothing but temples of vesta and jupiter satyr and the illusion would be complete if you do not read among the intercolumnations such inscriptions as gas company and life insurance these colonnades and pediments at first glance do not fail to produce a certain effect of splendor but all this magnificence is for the most part produced by mastic or roman cement for stone is very scarce in london it is in the new churches especially that the english architectural genius displays the most peculiar cosmopolitanism and makes the strangest confusion of styles above an egyptian pylon extends a greek order mingled with open roman arches the whole surmounted by a gothic spire this would make the meanest italian peasant shrug his shoulders with pity with very few exceptions all the modern monuments are in this style the english are rich active and industrious they can forge iron tame steam twist matter in every way and invent machinery of terrifying power they can be great poets but art properly so called will always be lacking to them form in itself will always escape them they feel this and it irritates them it wounds their national pride they understand that at bottom notwithstanding their prodigious material civilization they are merely varnished barbarians lord elgin who was so violently anathematized by lord bryan committed a useless sacrilege the parthenon bas-reliefs did not inspire anybody when brought to london the plastic gift is refused to the nations of the north the sun which places objects in relief accentuates their outlines and gives its true form to everything illumines those pale regions with too oblique array and then the english are not catholics 
Protestantism is as fatal as Islamism to the arts, and perhaps more so. In a country, artists can be only pagans or Catholics. In a country where the temples are only great square chambers, without pictures or statues or ornaments, where gentlemen in three-decker wigs talk to you seriously, and with many biblical allusions, of papist idols and the great horror of Babylon, art can never attain great heights, for the noblest end of statuary in painting is to fix in marble and on canvas the divine symbols of the religion in use in one's own country and period. Phidias carved the Venus, and Raphael painted the Madonna, but neither the one nor the other was Anglican. London may become Rome, but she certainly will never be Athens. The latter position seems to be reserved for Paris. There we find gold, power, material development in the highest degree, a gigantic exaggeration of all that can be done with money, patience, and will, the useful and the comfortable, but not the agreeable and the beautiful. Here, intelligence, grace, flexibility, finesse, easy comprehension of harmony and beauty, in one word, Greek qualities. The English will excel in all that can possibly be done, and more especially in what is impossible. They will establish a Bible society in Peking. They will arrive at Timbuktu in white gloves and patent leather shoes, in a condition of complete respectability. They will invent machinery to produce 600,000 pairs of stockings a minute, and they will even discover new countries in which to market their stockings, but they will never make a hat that a French grisette would put on her head. If taste could be bought, they would pay high for it. Happily, God has reserved to himself the distribution of two or three little things over which the gold of the mighty upon earth has no power, genius, beauty, and happiness. However, in spite of these criticisms of detail, the general effect of London is one that causes astonishment and a sort of stupor. It is really a capital in the sense of civilization. Everything is grand, splendid, and arranged according to the last degree of perfection. If anything, the streets are too wide, too big, too well lighted. The care of material facilities is carried to the utmost degree. In this respect, Paris is at least a hundred years behind London. The English houses are very flimsily built, for the ground they occupy does not belong to the builder. The whole land in the city is possessed, as in the Middle Ages, by a very small number of great lords or millionaires who permit building operations there for a price. This permission is purchased for a certain time, and it is so arranged that the house does not last longer than the lease. For this reason, in addition to the fragility of the materials employed, London is renewed every thirty years, and is able, as they say, to follow the progress of civilization. Added to this, the fire of 1666 made a complete clearance, which for my part I greatly regret, because I am not greatly fascinated by modern architecture, but prefer the picturesque to the comfortable. The English spirit is naturally methodical. In the streets, everybody naturally takes the right-hand side, and regular streams of people going up and down are formed. A handful of soldiers suffices for London, and even police have small occupation. I cannot remember having seen a single company of soldiers. The policemen, with numbered helmet on head and bracelet on sleeve to show that they are on duty, stroll about with a tranquil and philosophical air, with no other weapons but a little staff hardly two feet in length, and thus traverse the most populous districts. This immense circulation of people, this terrible movement that gives one the vertigo, is, so to speak, left to itself, and thanks to the good sense of the throng, no accident happens. The appearance of the populace is more miserable than in Paris. With us, the workmen, the people of the lower orders, wear clothes made for them, coarse, it is true, but of a special kind, and that evidently has always belonged to them. If their vest is in holes to-day, we know that originally they wore it when new. The grisettes and laborers are neat and clean, notwithstanding the simplicity of their dress 
but in London that is not the case. Everybody wears a tailcoat, a pair of trousers, and a tall hat, even the wretch who opens the door of your cab. The women all wear a hat and a long skirt, so that at first sight you think you see women of a superior class who have fallen into distressed circumstances, either through misconduct or misfortune. This arises from the fact that in London the common people dress in cast-off clothes, and from degradation to degradation the coat of a gentleman ends by covering the back of a gutter-snipe, and the satin bonnet of a duchess covers the head of an ignoble drudge. Even in St. Giles, in that sad Irish quarter, which in horror and dirt surpasses anything that can be imagined, you see hats and black coats often worn without shirts and buttoned over the skin that shows through their rents. St. Giles, however, is only a few steps away from Oxford Street and Piccadilly. This contrast is very violent. Without gradual transition, you pass from the most glaring opulence to the vilest misery. Carriages do not go down these alleys, full of puddles in which ragged children are crawling, and where big girls with disheveled hair, bare legs and arms, and a tattered shawl, tied across the breast, stare at you with a haggard and savage look. What suffering, what famine, is to be read on those faces so emaciated, wan, cadaverous, worn and pinched with cold. There you find poor wretches, who have always been famished since the day they were born. They all live on steamed potatoes, and very seldom have bread to eat. From privation the blood of these unfortunates becomes impoverished and turns from red to yellow, as medical men have affirmed. On the houses of some of these dwellers in St. Giles there are such notices as furnished cellar for a single gentleman. This ought to give you a sufficient idea of the place. I had the curiosity to enter one of these basements, and I assure you I have never seen anything so bare. It would seem impossible for human beings to exist in such hovels. It is true that they die there by the thousand. This is the reverse of the metal of every civilization. Monstrous fortunes are explained by frightful miseries. In order that a few may devour a great deal, many must fast. The higher the palace is raised, the deeper must be the foundations, and nowhere is this disproportion so manifest as in England. To be poor in London seems to me to be one of the tortures forgotten by Dante in his spiral of sufferings. To possess gold is so visibly the sole recognized merit that the English poor despise themselves and humbly accept the arrogance and disdain of the easy and wealthy classes. The English, who talk so much about the idols of the papists, ought not to forget that the golden calf is the most infamous idol of all, and the one that exacts the most sacrifice. The squares, which are very numerous, are a happy corrective of the fetidness of these sewers. The Place Royale in Paris can convey the best idea of an English square. A square as a space surrounded by houses of uniform architecture. The centre being a garden planted with great trees and enclosed by iron railings. Its sward of emerald green affords delightful repose to eyes tired by the sombre hues of the sky and the edifices. The squares often communicate one with another and occupy much ground. Splendid squares in the vicinity of Hyde Park are inhabited by the nobility. No shop nor storehouse is allowed to disturb the aristocratic quietude of these elegant retreats. Nothing could be more charming than these extensive enclosures, so tranquil, green, and fresh. It is true that I never saw anybody walking in these attractive gardens to which each of the tenants has a key. It is sufficient for them to be able to keep others out. The squares and the parks form one of the chief charms of London. St. James Park, close to Pall Mall, is a delightful promenade. You go down into it by a wide flight of steps, worthy of Babylon, which is situated at the foot of the Duke of York's column. The walk along the Egyptian terrace of Carlton Place is wide and beautiful but what pleased me above all was the large sheets of water thronged with herons, ducks, and other aquatic birds. 
the english excel in the art of giving to artificial gardens a romantic and natural appearance westminster the towers of which peep above the clumps of trees admirably closes the view on the river side hyde park where the horses and carriages of fashion parade looks quite rural and countrified by the extent of its water and green slopes it is not a garden but a landscape you are astonished to find such large open spaces in a city like london regent's park that contains the zoological gardens and is bordered by palaces in the style of the garde moubelle and the minister of marine in paris is truly enormous you can lose yourself in it an undulation of the surface of which very skilful use has been made produces most picturesque effects End of A Day in London by Theophile Gautier The String Quartet by Virginia Woolf This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times well here we are and if you cast your eye over the room you will see that tubes and trams and omnibuses private carriages not a few even i venture to believe landaus with bays in them have been busy at it weaving threads from one end of london to the other yet i begin to have my doubts if indeed it's true as they're saying that regent street is up and the treaty signed and the weather not cold for the time of year and even at that rent not a flat to be had and the worst of influenza its after effects if i bethink me of having forgotten to write about the leak in the larder and left my glove in the train if the ties of blood require me leaning forward to accept cordially the hand which is perhaps offered hesitatingly seven years since we met the last time in venice and where are you living now well the late afternoon suits me the best though if it weren't asking too much but i knew you at once still the war made a break if the mines shot through by such little arrows and for human society compels it no sooner is one launched than another presses forward if this engenders heat and in addition they've turned on the electric light if saying one thing does in so many cases leave behind it a need to improve and revise stirring besides regrets pleasures vanities and desires if it's all the facts i mean and the hats the fur boas the gentlemen's swallow-tail coats and pearl tie-pins that come to the surface what chance is there of what it becomes every minute more difficult to say why in spite of everything i sit here believing i can't now say what or even remember the last time it happened did you see the procession the king looked cold no 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 but what was it she's bought a house at malmesbury how lucky to find one on the contrary it seems to me pretty sure that she whoever she may be is damned since it's all a matter of flats and hats and seagulls or so it seems to be for a hundred people sitting here well dressed walled in furred replete not that i can boast since i too sit passive on a gilt chair only turning the earth above a buried memory as we all do for there are signs if i'm not mistaken that we're all recalling something furtively seeking something why fidget why so anxious about the sit of cloaks and gloves whether to button or unbutton then watch that elderly face against the dark canvas a moment ago urbane and flushed now taciturn and sad as if in shadow was it the sound of the second violin tuning in the ante-room here they come four black figures carrying instruments and seat themselves facing the white squares under the downpour of light rest the tips of their bows on the music stand with a simultaneous movement lift them lightly poise them and looking across the player opposite 
the first violin counts one two three flourish spring burgeon burst the pear tree on the top of the mountain fountains jet drops descend but the waters of the rhone flow swift and deep race under the arches and sweep the trailing water leaves washing shadows over the silver fish the spotted fish rushed down by the swift waters now swept into an eddy where it's difficult this conglomeration of fish all in a pool leaping splashing scraping sharp fins and such a boil of current that the yellow pebbles are churned round and round round and round free now rushing downwards or even somehow ascending in exquisite spirals into the air curled like thin shavings from under a plane up and up how lovely goodness is in those who stepping lightly go smiling through the world also in jolly old fishwives squatted under arches obscene old women how deeply they laugh and shake and rollick when they walk from side to side hum ha that's an early mozart of course but the tune like all his tunes makes one despair i mean hope what do i mean that's the worst of music i want to dance laugh eat pink cakes yellow cakes drink thin sharp wine or an indecent story now i could relish that the older one grows the more one likes indecency ha ha i'm laughing what at you said nothing nor did the old gentleman opposite but suppose suppose hush the melancholy river bears us on when the moon comes through the trailing willow boughs i see your face i hear your voice and the birds singing as we pass the osier bed what are you whispering sorrow sorrow joy joy woven together like reeds in moonlight woven together inextricably commingled bound in pain and strewn in sorrow crash the boat sinks rising the figures ascend but now leaf thin tapering to a dusky wraith which fiery tipped draws its twofold passion from my heart for me it sings unseals my sorrow thaws compassion floods with love the sunless world nor ceasing abates its tenderness but deftly subtly weaves in and out until in this pattern this consummation the cleft ones unify soar sob sink to rest sorrow and joy why then grieve ask what remain unsatisfied i say all's been settled yes laid to rest under a coverlet of rose leaves falling falling ah but they cease one rose leaf falling from an enormous height like a little parachute dropped from an invisible balloon turns flutters waveringly it won't reach us no no i noticed nothing that's the worst of music these silly dreams the second violin was late you say there's old mrs monroe feeling her way out blinder each year poor woman on this slippery floor eyeless old age gray-headed sphinx there she stands on the pavement beckoning so sternly the red omnibus how lovely how well they play how 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 the tongue is but a clapper simplicity itself the feathers in the hat next me are bright and pleasing as a child's rattle the leaf on the plane tree flashes green through the chink in the curtain very strange very exciting how 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 hush these are the lovers on the grass if madam you will take my hand sir i would trust you with my heart moreover we have left our bodies in the banqueting hall those on the turf are the shadows of our souls then these are the embraces of our souls the lemons nod assent the swan pushes from the bank and floats dreaming into midstream but to return he followed me down the corridor and as we turned the corner 
trod on the lace of my petticoat. What could I do but cry, ah, and stop to finger it? At which he drew his sword, made passes as if he were stabbing something to death, and cried, Mad, mad, mad! Whereupon I screamed, and the prince, who was writing in the large vellum book in the oriel window, came out in his velvet skull-cap and furred slippers, snatched a rapier from the wall, the king of Spain's gift, you know, on which I escaped, flinging on this coat to hide the ravages to my skirt, to hide. But listen, the horns. The gentleman replies so fast to the lady, and she runs up the scale with such witty exchange of compliment, now culminating in a sob of passion, that the words are indistinguishable through the meaning, though the meaning is plain enough. Love, laughter, flight, pursuit, celestial bliss, all floated out on the gayest ripple of tender endearment, until the sound of the silver horns, at first far distant, gradually sounds more and more distinctly, as if seneschals were saluting the dawn or proclaiming ominously the escape of the lovers. The green garden, moonlit pool, lemons, lovers, and fish are all dissolved in the opal sky, across which, as the horns are joined by trumpets and supported by clarions, there rise white arches firmly planted on marble pillars. Tramp and trumpeting, clang and clangor, firm establishment, fast foundations, march of myriads, confusion and chaos trod to earth, but this city to which we travel has neither stone nor marble, hangs enduring, stands unshakable, nor does a face, nor does a flag greet or welcome. Leave then to perish your hope, droop in the desert my joy, naked advance, bare are the pillars auspicious to none casting no shade resplendent severe back then i fall eager no more despairing only to go find the street mark the buildings greet the apple woman say to the maid who opens the door a starry night good night good night you go this way alas i go that End of The String Quartet by Virginia Woolf An Andalusian Duel by Serafin Estebanes Calderon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times An Andalusian Duel by Serafin Estebanes Calderon For The Tales of the Cities Compilation Through the little square of St. Anna, towards a certain tavern, where the best wine is to be quaffed in Seville, there walked, in measured steps, two men whose demeanor clearly manifested the soil which gave them birth. He who walked in the middle of the street, taller than the other by about a finger's length, and sported with affected carelessness the wide slouched hat of Essia, with tassels of glass beads and a ribbon as black as his sins. He wore a cloak gathered under his left arm. The right, emerging from a turquoise lining, exposed the merino lambskin with silver clasps. The herdsman's boots, white with Turkish buttons, the breeches, gleaming red from below the cloak and covering the knee, and above all his strong and robust appearance, dark curly hair and eye like a red-hot coal, proclaimed at a distance that all this combination belonged to one of those men who put an end to horses between their knees and tire out the bull with their lance. He walked on, arguing with his companion, who was rather spare than prodigal in his person, but marvelously lithe and supple. The latter was shod with low shoes, garters united the stockings to the light blue breeches, the waistcoat was cane-colored, his sash light green, and jaunty shoulder knots, lappets, and rows of buttons ornamented the carmelite jacket. The open cloak, the hat drawn over his ear, his short clean steps, and the manifestations in all his limbs and movements of agility and elasticity beyond trial plainly showed that in the arena, carmine cloth in hand, he would mock at the most frenzied of Yorama bulls, 
or the best horned beasts from Utrera. I, who adore and die for such people, though the compliment be not returned, went slowly in the wake of their worships, and, unable to restrain myself, entered with them the same tavern, or rather eating-house, since there they serve certain provocatives as well as wine, and I, as my readers perceive, love to call things by their right name. I entered and sat down at once, and in such a manner as not to interrupt Oliver and Roland, and that they might not notice me, when I saw that, as if believing themselves alone, they threw their arms with an amicable gesture round each other's neck, and thus began their discourse. Pulpit, said the taller, now that we are going to meet each other, knife in hand, you here, I there, one, two, on your guard, tris tras, have that, take this, and call it what you like, let us first drain a tankard to the music and measure of some songs. Signor Bobella, replied Popete, drawing his face aside and spitting with the greatest neatness and pultritude toward his shoe, I am not the kind of man either for la gorja or other similar earthly matters, or because a still tongue is sheathed in my body, or my weazened slit, or for any other such trifle, to be provoked or vexed with such a friend as Balbeja. Let the wine be brought, and then we will sing, and afterwards blood, blood to the hilt. The order was given. They clinked glasses, and, looking one at the other, sang a civilian song. This done, they threw off their cloaks with an easy grace, and unsheathed their knives with which to prick one another, the one Flemish with a white haft, the other from Guadix, with a guard to the hilt, both blades dazzling in their brightness, and sharpened and ground enough for operating upon cataracts, much less ripping up bellies and bowels. The two had already cleft the air several times with the said lancets, their cloak wound round their left arm, first drawing closer, then back, now more boldly, and in bounds, when Popete hoisted the flag for parley, and said, Balbeja, my friend, I only beg you to do me the favor not to fan my face with Julian, your knife, since a slash might use it so ill that my mother who bore me would not know me, and I should not like to be considered ugly. Neither is it right to mar and destroy what God made in his likeness. Agreed, replied Balbeja. I will aim lower. Except, except my stomach also, for I was ever a friend to cleanliness, and I should not like to see myself fouled in a bad way, if your knife and arm played havoc with my liver and intestines. I will strike higher, but let us go on. Take care of my chest, it was always weak. Then just tell me, friend, where am I to sound or tap you? My dear Babeja, there's always plenty of time and space to hack at a man, I have here on my left arm a wen, of which you can make meat as much as you like. Here goes for it, said Balbeja, and he hurled himself like an arrow. The other warded off the thrust with his cloak, and both, like skilful penmen, began again tracing S's and signatures in the air with dashes and flourishes, without, however, raising a particle of skin. I do not know what would have been the end of this onslaught, since my venerable, dry, and shriveled person was not suitable for forming a point of exclamation between two combatants, and the tavern-keeper troubled so little about what was happening that he drowned the stamping of their feet and clatter of the tumbling stools and utensils by scraping street music on a guitar as loud as he could. Otherwise, he was as calm as if he were entertaining two angels instead of two devils incarnate. I do not know, I repeat, how the scene would have ended when there crossed the threshold a parsonage who came to take a part in the development of the drama. There entered, I say, a woman of twenty to twenty-two years of age, diminutive in body, superlative in audacity and grace neat and clean hose, and shoes, short black flounced 
petticoat, a linked girdle, headdress or mantilla of fringed taffeta caught together at the nape of her neck, and a corner of it over her shoulder. She passed before my eyes with swaying hips, arms akimbo, and moving her head to and fro as she looked about her on all sides. Upon seeing her, the tavern-keeper dropped his instrument, and I was overtaken by perturbation, such as I had not experienced for thirty years. I am, after all, only flesh and blood. But without halting for such lay figures, she advanced to the field of battle. There was a lively to-do here. Don Polpete and Don Balbeja, when they saw Doña Gorja appear, first cause of the disturbance and future prize for the victor, increased their feints, flourishes, curvets, onsets, crouching and bounds, all, however, without touching a hair. Our Helen witnessed in silence for a long time this scene in history with that feminine pleasure which the daughters of Eve enjoy at, at such critical moments. But gradually, her pretty brow clouded over until, drawing from her delicate ear, not a flower or earring, but the stump of a cigar, she hurled it amidst the jousters. Not even Charles V's cane, in the last duel in Spain, produced such favorable effects. Both came forward immediately with formal respect, and each, by reason of the discomposure of his person and clothes, presumed to urge a title by which to recommend himself to the fair with the flounces. She, as though pensive, was going over the passage of arms in her mind, and then, with firm and confident resolution, spoke thus. And is this a fair for me? Who else should it be for, since I, since nobody? They replied in the same breath. Listen, gentlemen, said she, for females such as I and my parts, of my charms and descent, daughter of La Gatusa, niece of La Mindes, and the granddaughter of La Astrosa, know that there are neither pacts nor compacts, nor any such futile things, nor are any of them worth a farthing. And when men challenge each other, let the knife do its work, and the red blood flow, so as not to have my mother's daughter present without giving her the pleasure of snapping her fingers in the face of the other. If you pretend you are fighting for me, it's a lie. You are wholly mistaken, and that not by halves. I love neither of you. Mingalarios of Zafra is to my taste, and he and I look upon you with scorn and contempt. Good-bye, my braves, and, if you like, call my man to account. She spoke, spat, smoothed the saliva with the point of her shoe, looking Popete and Balbeja full in the face, and went out with the same expressive movements with which she entered. The two unvarnished braggarts followed the valorous Doña Gorja with their eyes, and then with a despicable gesture drew their knives across their sleeve as though wiping off the blood there might have been, sheathed them at one and the same time, and said together, through woman the world was lost. Through a woman Spain was lost, but it has never been known, nor do ballads relate, nor the blind beggars sing, nor is it heard in the square or markets that two valiant men killed each other for another lover. Give me that fist, Don Popote. Your hand, Don Balbeja. They spoke and strode out into the street, the best friends in the world, leaving me all amazed at such whimsicality. End of An Andalusian Duel by Serafin Estebanez Calderon Private Houses and Local Customs in Seville by Nathaniel Armstrong Wells This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times Seville. The greater number of private houses are situated in an interminable labyrinth of winding streets between the Calle de la Sierpe and Plaza de San Francisco and the city wall, which connects the aqueduct of Carmona with the Alcazar. It is the southeastern half of the city.
to the west of the Calle de la Sierpe, there are also a few streets containing private residences, but they are not in so large a proportion. Some of the most elegant are, however, on this side, which being less Moorish and more modern, is less charry of its attractions, and allows a part of its decoration to enliven the external facades, while its spacious doorways frequently open to the view of the passer-by, a gay perspective of gardens and courts. The sunny balcony, crowded with a crimson forest of cactuses, is not more attractive to the sight than the more mysterious vista beneath it, of retreating colonnades, mingled with orange and pomegranate trees, through which the murmur of the fountain is scarcely audible. Few cities present more charms to the wanderer than one in which the houses offer a combination so luxurious as is met with in the greater number of those of Seville. The cool summer rooms opening into the court, in which the drawing-room furniture is arranged on all sides of a fountain, plentifully supplied from the aqueduct of Carmona, and on the upper floor the winter apartments chosen from their being better lighted for the deposit of a collection of pictures and these almost always excellent and opening to the gallery to which during this season the furniture having been removed from below is placed together with the work frames and portable musical instruments on the side exposed to the sun one sees these houses and their amiable and happy-looking inhabitants, and imagines there is no life to be compared to it. Yet the experiment may be made, and fail to answer the expectations of the stranger, who, confident in his discovery of the road to happiness, may have pitched his tent in the midst of these bewitching regions. Can it be fatality, or is it essential in human nature to find ever the least felicity there, where it looks for the greatest? The experiment, I say, was made. An Englishman, possessing every advantage of taste, talent, and wealth, took up his residence here, resolved to devote the remainder of his days to the peaceable enjoyments of a literary and social life. Thanks to his literary propensities, we are enabled to judge of the result of the trial. In a book published by the person to whom I allude, we find that no one could be less satisfied with his lot. Seville and the Sevillanos meet with no mercy at his hands, and must, if we may judge by his dislike of them, have rendered his life a burden." This, however, is a single example, and insufficient to deter others from the attempt. It may be that this individual had not entered fully into the spirit of Andalusian existence, every detail of life being here adapted to the place and its customs and climate. No custom can be erred against the impunity, that is, without the forfeit of some corresponding advantage. Seville presents two so different aspects during the two opposite seasons of the year, that to be well understood it should be visited at both. During the winter the existence does not materially differ from that of the inhabitants of most other European towns, excepting that the intercourse of society is subjected to less formality. Cards of invitation are rarely made use of, and you are not, consequently exposed to the annoyance of seeing and hearing your house invaded by a dense crowd on a night you have appointed a month before without any possibility of foreseeing whether you would be disposed or not on that particular night to undergo such a toil these crowds are i believe unheard of in seville but those who are pleased in each other's society know where to find each other and without waiting for invitations small circles are formed every evening from which all crushing fatigue and intense dressing are excluded the winter is also a more advantageous season for the stranger who would be totally debarred by the summer heats from the activity necessary for the satisfaction of his curiosity in visiting the objects of interest contained in and around seville 
on the other hand the summer season offers to his contemplation the successful attainment of a mode of existence suited to the burning climate a problem found to be solved but in few instances the first and most essential arrangement appears to be the turning night into day and vice versa as far as regards society and all locomotion no one leaves his house until long after sunset and visiting commences some hours later the morning being consequently the time for repose and the breakfast hour nevertheless remaining the same all the year round the siesta is very essential and is judiciously placed between the dinner which terminates at four and the hour for movement nine when the civiliano refreshed by three or four hours sleep and a fresh toilet is infinitely better disposed for the evening's amusements than the denizen of more northern climes who rises at that or a later hour from the chief repast of the day and is put en train by the less natural and less durable stimulants of the table this mode of life presents other numerous advantages a very prominent one is the inviolable division of time between society and solitude we suppose the hour for rising eight immediately after the chocolate that of breakfast eleven the intervening hours are solitary and are frequently divided between the pillow and the toilet while they are sometimes devoted to more useful occupations and added to by early risers from the family meeting at breakfast until the dinner hour three the time may be employed in business reading in fact in every one's habitual pursuits no intrusion is to be feared no accursed killer lounges in to interrupt with his compliments or gossip your letter to your lawyer or if you are a lawyer yourself that to your client nor is the conscience of scrupulous porters burdened with the mendacious not at home these hours are sacred and guaranteed by the very air which renders the streets impassable but leaves the cool court protected from the sun's ray by the toldo canvas awning spread at a level with the roof and which is reefed up at night like a sail and refreshed by its ever murmuring fountain and cool marble pavement to the peaceable enjoyment of its owners the female portion of the family are thus enabled to devote themselves to household occupations or to their favorite employments without having to undergo until the second getting up in the evening the fever of a complete toilet which would during the day be insupportable the time thus devoted to society is amply sufficient as it may be prolonged as each party feels inclined from an hour or two after sunset until the returning rays drive all back to their cool retreat the night of the festival of st john is in seville sacred from remote time to amusement and festivity during the five or six hours of darkness accorded by the midsummer sun the banks of the guadalquivir echo the gay melodious laugh which enlivens the animated buzz of the crowd and the morning ray gilds the upper windows of the deserted houses before their doors are opened to the supper craving population the right practised on this occasion is marked by a simplicity altogether antique the youth of seville that is the masculine portion have provided themselves with small boxes containing a sort of sugar-plum of exquisite flavor one of these is held between the finger and the thumb of the caballero from the moment he sets foot on the promenade on the approach of a party of ladies he endeavors to distinguish as far off as the gloom permits the features or dress of an already selected object of preference or if still free to make a selection some countenance possessed of sufficient attraction to determine his choice on discovering the owner of either of these requisites he watches a favorable opportunity and approaching the lady offers the bonbon the senorita of course unmarried thus selected 
is obliged to accept the compliments, if properly offered, as well as the arm of the Calviero, during the rest of the night, and, on arriving at her house, he receives from her parents, or chaperon, as the case may be, an invitation to supper. Should the lady be desirous of avoiding the compliment, of the approach of which she is usually aware she must exercise her ingenuity in putting obstacles in the way of the attempt in this effort many are successful since the peculiar mode of proceeding obligatory on those who make the offer affords certain facilities the condition is not binding on the fair object of the compliment unless the lips receive the bonbon immediately from the finger and thumb of the cavalier this is a source of no small amusement to the senoritas at the expense of strangers from other provinces of spain conscious of being the object of preference of some young beginner or stranger uninitiated in the mysteries of the rite and who let it be understood does not happen to be an object of preference with them they will afford him every facility of approach, and, on receiving the present in the hand, will repulse without mercy the luckless white whose retiring steps are accompanied by peals of laughter from all the party. The month of June is likewise distinguished by the procession of the Corpus Christi. On this occasion all the principal streets are protected from the sun by canvas awnings, and from the windows of every house draperies are suspended the materials of which are more or less rich according to the means of their respective proprietors from an early hour of the morning ushered in by sunshine and the gay orchestra of the giraldo bells the vast marble pavement of the cathedral begins to disappear beneath the momentarily increasing crowd here all classes are mingled, but the most conspicuous are the arrivals from the surrounding villages, distinguished by their more sunburnt complexions and the showy colors of their costume, contrasted with the uniformly dark tints of the attire of the Sevillanos. Here are seen also in great numbers, accompanied by their relatives, the gay cigarreras, whose acquaintances we shall presently make in the fabrica de tabaco the instinctive coquetry discernible no less in the studied reserve of their looks than in the smart step and faultless nicety of costume indicates how easy would be the transition to the quality of the still more piquant but somewhat less moral maha the black satin low-quartered shoe is of a different material but the snow-white stocking and dark green skirt the same and the black velvet bordered mantilla is the identical one which was held tight to the chin when passing the evening before under the city walls on the return from the manufactory to the faubourg at the other extremity of seville the procession headed by a band of music and accompanied by the dignitaries of the diocese and civil authorities of the province bearing sierges winds through the principal streets and re-enters the church to the sound of the two magnificent organs never heard in unison except on this anniversary the exterior of the principal portal is ornamented on this occasion with a sort of curtain which is said to contain upwards of three thousand yards of crimson velvet bordered with gold lace the columns of the centre nave are also completely attired from top to bottom with coverings of the same material the value of the velvet employed is stated at nearly ten thousand pounds christmas day is also solemnized at seville with much zeal but the manner of doing it honor presents more of novelty than splendor at the early hour of seven the parish churches are completely filled the organ pours forth from that time until the termination of the service an uninterrupted succession of airs called seguidillas from the dance to which they are adapted 
on the gallery which adjoins the organ loft of each church are established five or six muscular youths selected for their untiring activity they are provided each with a tambourine and their duty consists in drawing from it as much and as varied sound as it will render without coming to pieces with this view they enter upon the amiable contest and try during three or four hours which of their number employing hands knees feet and elbows in succession can produce the most racking intonations on the pavement immediately below there is generally a group composed of the friends of the performers as may be discerned from the smiles of intelligence directed upwards and downwards some of these appear from the animated signs of approbation and encouragement with which they reward each more than usually violent concussion to be backers of favorite heroes during all this time one or two priests are engaged before the altar in the performance of a series of noiseless ceremonies and the pavement of the body of the church is pressed by the knees of a dense crowd of devotees the propensity to robbery and assassination attributed by several tourists to the population of this country has been much exaggerated the imagination of the stranger is usually so worked upon by these accounts as to induce him never to set foot outside the walls of whatever city he inhabits without being well armed as far as regards the environs of seville this precaution is superfluous they may be traversed in all directions at all events within walking distance or to the extent of a moderate ride without risk far from exercising violence the peasants never fail in passing to greet the stranger with a respectful salutation but i cannot be guarantee for other towns or environs which i have not visited it is certain that equal security does not exist nearer the coast on the frequented roads which communicate between san lucar zeres and cadiz nor in the opposite direction throughout the mountain passes of the sierra morena but this state of things is far from being universal i would much prefer passing a night on a country road in the neighborhood of seville to threading the maze of the streets which form the southeastern portion of the town mentioned above as containing the greater number of the residences of private families this quarter is not without its perils in fact if dark deeds are practiced no situation could possibly be better suited to them these arab streets wind and twist and turn back on themselves like a serpent in pain every ten yards presents a hiding place there is just sufficient lighting up at night to prevent your distinguishing whether the street is clear or not and the ground floors of the houses in the winter season are universally deserted an effectual warning was afforded me almost immediately on my arrival at seville against frequenting this portion of the town without precaution after nightfall an acquaintance a young sevillano who had been my daily companion during the first five or six days which followed my arrival was in the habit of frequenting with assiduity some of the above-mentioned streets he inhabited one of them and was continually drawn by potent attraction towards two others in one in particular he followed a practice the imprudence of which in more than one respect as he was my junior i had already pointed out to him a lady as you have already conjectured resided in the house in question my friend like many of his compatriots sighed to many but he loved this one and she was precisely the one that could ne'er be his she allowed him however a harmless rendezvous separated from all danger as she thought by the distance from the ground to the balcony situated on the first floor the lady being married and regular visiting being only possible at formal intervals these interviews had by degrees alarmingly as appeared to me increased in frequency and duration until at length during two hours each evening my acquaintance poured forth in a subdued tone calculated to reach only the fair form which bent over the balcony his tender complaints 
the youth of these climes are communicative on subjects which so deeply interest their feelings and whether willing or not one is often admitted to share their secrets at the commencement of an acquaintance it was thus that i had had an opportunity of lecturing my friend on the various dangers attending the practice in which he was persisting and of recommending him the best advice of all being of course useless to revive the more prudent custom of bygone times and if he must offer nightly incense to the object of his fire to adopt the mode sanctioned by count almaviva and entrust his vows to the mercenary eloquence of choristers and catgut to anything or anybody provided it be done by proxy my warning was vain but the mischief did not befall him exactly in the manner i had contemplated his cousin opened my door while I was breakfasting, and informed me that L. was in the house of Don G. A., and in bed, having received a wound the previous night from some robbers, and that he wished to see me. I found him in a house, into which I had already been introduced, being one of those he most frequented. A bed had been prepared in the drawing-room all the window shutters of which were closed and he was lying there surrounded by the family of his host to whom was added his sister as he was unable to speak above a whisper i was given the seat by the bedside while he related to me his adventure he had just quitted the street of the balcony at about nine o'clock and was approaching the house we were now in when on turning a corner he was attacked by three ruffians one of whom demanded his money in the usual terms your purse or your life while before he had time to reply but was endeavouring to pass on a second faced him and stabbed him in the breast through his cloak he then ran forward followed by the three down the street into the house and up the staircase the robbers not quitting the pursuit until he rang the bell on the first floor. The surgeon had been immediately called, and had pronounced his, him wounded within not an inch, but the tenth part of an inch, of his life, for the steel had penetrated to within the distance of his heart. My first impression was that the robbers were acting a part, and had been hired to get rid of him otherwise what were the utility of stabbing him when they might have rifled his pockets without such necessity but this he assured me could not be the case as the person most likely to fall under such suspicion was incapable of employing similar means adding that that was the usual mode of committing robberies in seville i left him after having assured him how much i envied his good fortune seeing that he was in no danger and only condemned to pass a week or two in the society of charming women all zealously employed in nursing him for such was the truth one of the young ladies being supposed and i fear with justice to be the object of his addresses the ungrateful wretch convinced me by his reply as we conversed in french and were not understood by those present that his greatest torment was impatient to escape from his confinement in order to see or write to the other fair one at the end of the week he was sufficiently recovered to be removed to the house of his family from certain hints dropped during a conversation which took place more than a month after the event it is to be feared that the knife of the assassin in approaching so near to the heart of his intended victim succeeded by some mysterious electric transmission in inflicting a positive wound on that of the lady of the balcony i afterwards learned that it was usual for those who inhabited or frequented this part of seville and indeed all other parts excepting the few principal thoroughfares and streets containing the shops and cafes to carry arms after nightfall and in shaking hands with an acquaintance i have sometimes perceived a naked sword-blade half visible among the folds of his cloak these perils only exist in the winter and not in all winters only in those during which provisions increase in price beyond the average and the season is more than usually rigorous the poor being thus exposed to more than the accustomed privations 
there are towns in which assassinations and robbery are marked by more audacity than is their habitual character in this part of andalusia of these malaga is said to be one of the worst although perhaps the most favored spot in europe with respect to natural advantages an instance of daring ruffianism occurred there this winter a person of consideration in the town had been found in the street stabbed and robbed his friends being possessed of much influence and disposing no doubt of other weighty inducements to action the police was aroused to unusual activity the murderer was arrested and brought before the alcade primero a summary mode of jurisprudence was put in practice and the culprit was ordered for execution on the following day on being led from the presence of the court he turned to the alcad and addressing him with vehemence threatened him with certain death in the event of the sentence being put in execution the alcade although doubtless not entirely free from anxiety was by the threat itself the more forcibly bound to carry into effect the judgment he had pronounced the execution therefore took place at the appointed hour the following morning the dead body of the alcade was found in a street adjoining that in which he resided End of private houses and local customs in seville by Nathaniel Armstrong Wells. Letter one by Isabella L. Bird from Unbeaten Tracks in Japan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. Letter one of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird for the Tales of the Cities compilation. First View of Japan, A Vision of Fujisan, Japanese Sampans, Pullman Cars, Undignified Locomotion, Paper Money, The Drawbacks of Japanese Traveling. Oriental Hotel, Yokohama, May 21st. Eighteen days of unintermitted, rolling over, desolate, rainy seas brought the city of Tokyo earlier yesterday morning to Cape King and by noon we were steaming up the Gulf of Yedo, quite near the shore. The day was soft and gray with a little faint blue sky, and, though the coast of Japan is much more prepossessing than most coasts, there were no startling surprises either of color or form. Broken wooded ridges, deeply cleft, rise from the water's edge. Gray, deep-rooted villages, cluster about the mouths of the ravines and terraces of rice cultivation bright with the greenness of english lawns run up to a great height among dark masses of upland forest the populousness of the coast is very impressive and the gulf everywhere was equally peopled with fishing boats of which we pass not only hundreds but thousands in five hours the coast and sea were pale and the boats were pale too, their hulls being unpainted wood, and their sails pure white duck. Now and then a high-sterned junk drifted by like a phantom galley. Then we slackened speed to avoid exterminating a fleet of triangular-looking fishing boats with white square sails, and so on through the grayness and dumbness hour after hour. For long I looked in vain for Fujisan, and failed to see it, though I heard ecstasies all over the deck, till, accidentally looking heavenwards instead of earthwards, I saw far above any possibility of height, as one would have thought, a huge truncated cone of pure snow, thirteen thousand and eighty feet above the sea, from which it sweeps upwards in a glorious curve, very wan, against a very pale blue sky with its base and the intervening country veiled in a pale gray mist it was a wonderful vision and shortly as a vision vanished except the cone of tristan d'acuna also a cone of snow i never saw a mountain rise in such lonely majesty with nothing near or far to detract from its height and grandeur 
no wonder that it is a sacred mountain and so dear to the japanese that their art is never weary of representing it it was nearly fifty miles off when we first saw it the air and water were alike motionless the mist was still and pale gray clouds lay restfully on a bluish sky the reflections of the white sails of the fishing boats scarcely quivered it was all so pale wan and ghastly that the turbulence of crumpled foam which we left behind us and our noisy throbbing progress seemed a boisterous intrusion upon sleeping asia the gulf narrowed the forest crested hills the terraced ravines the picturesque gray villages the quiet beach life and the pale blue masses of the mountains of the interior became more visible fuji retired into the mist in which he enfolds his grandeur for most of the summer we passed reception bay perry island webster island cape saratoga and mississippi bay american nomenclature which perpetuates the, the success of american diplomacy and not far from treaty point came upon a red lightship with the words treaty point in large letters upon her outside of this no foreign vessel may anchor the bustle among my fellow-passengers many of whom were returning home and all of whom expected to be met by friends left me at leisure as i looked at unattractive unfamiliar yokohama and the pale gray land stretched out before me to speculate somewhat sadly on my destiny on these strange shores on which i have not even an acquaintance on mooring we were at once surrounded by crowds of native boats called by foreigners sampans and dr gulick a near relation of my hilo friends came on board to meet his daughter welcomed me cordially and relieved me of all the trouble of disembarkation these sampans are very clumsy looking but are managed with great dexterity by the boatmen who gave and received any number of bumps with much good nature and without any of the shouting and swearing in which competitive boatmen usually indulge the partially triangular shape of these boats approaches that of a salmon fisher's punt used on certain british rivers being floored gives them the appearance of being absolutely flat-bottomed but though they tilt readily they are very safe being heavily built and fitted together with singular precision with wooden bolts and a few copper cleats they are sculled not what we should call rowed by two or four men with very heavy oars made of two pieces of wood working on pens placed on outrigger bars the men skull standing and use the thigh as a rest for the oar they all wear a single wide-sleeved scanty blue cotton garment not fastened or girdled at the waist straw sandals kept on by a thong passing between the great toe and the others and if they wear any headgear it is only a wisp of blue cotton tied round the forehead the one garment is only an apology for clothing and displays lean concave chests and lean muscular limbs the skin is very yellow and often much tattooed with mythical beasts the charge for sampans is fixed by tariff so the traveller lands without having his temper ruffled by extortionate demands the first thing that impressed me on landing was that there were no loafers and that all the small ugly kindly-looking shriveled bandy-legged round-shouldered concave-chested poor-looking beings in the streets had some affairs of their own to mind at the top of the landing steps there was a portable restaurant a neat and most compact thing with charcoal stove cooking and eating utensils complete but it looked as if it were made by and for dolls and the mannequin who kept it was not five feet high at the custom house we were attended to by minute officials in blue uniforms of european pattern and leather boots very civil creatures who opened and examined our trunks carefully and strapped them up again contrasting pleasingly with the insolent and rapacious officials who perform the same duties at new york outside were about fifty of the now well-known jintikishas 
and the air was full of a buzz produced by the rapid reiteration of this uncouth word by fifty tongues this conveyance as you know is a feature of japan growing in importance every day it was only invented seven years ago and already there are nearly twenty three thousand in one city and men can make so much more by drawing them than by almost any kind of skilled labor that thousands of fine young men desert agricultural pursuits and flock into the towns to make draught animals of themselves though it is said that the average duration of a man's life after he takes to running is only five years and that the runners fall victim in large numbers to aggravated forms of heart and lung disease over tolerably level ground a good runner can trot forty miles a day at a rate of about four miles an hour they are registered and taxed at eight s a year for one carrying two persons and four s for one which carries one only and there is a regular tariff for time and distance the kuruma or genri kisha consists of a light perambulator body an adjustable hood of oiled paper a velvet or cloth lining and cushion a well for parcels under the seat two high slim wheels and a pair of shafts connected by a bar at the ends the body is usually lacquered and decorated according to its owner's taste some show little except polished brass others are altogether inlaid with shells known as venus's ear and others are gaudily painted with contorted dragons or groups of peonies hydrangeas chrysanthemums and mythical personages they cost from two pounds upwards the shafts rest on the ground at a steep incline as you get in it must require much practice to enable one to mount with ease or dignity the runner lifts them up gets into them gives the body a good tilt backwards and goes off at a smart trot they are drawn by one two or three men according to the speed desired by the occupants when rain comes on the man puts up the hood and ties you and it closely up in a covering of oiled paper in which you are invisible at night whether running or standing still they carry prettily painted circular paper lanterns eighteen inches long it is most comical to see stout florid solid-looking merchants missionaries male and female fashionably dressed ladies armed with card cases chinese compradors and japanese peasant men and women flying along main street which is like the decent respectable high street of a dozen forgotten country towns in england in happy unconsciousness of the ludicrousness of their appearance racing chasing crossing each other their lean polite pleasant runners in their great hats shaped like inverted bowls their incomprehensible blue tights and their short blue overshirts with badges or characters in white upon them tearing along their yellow faces streaming with perspiration laughing shouting and avoiding collisions by a mere shave after a visit to the consulate i entered a karuma and with two ladies and two more was bowled along at a furious pace by a laughing little mannequin down main street a narrow solid well-paved street with well-made sidewalks curbstones and gutters with iron lamp-posts gas lamps and foreign shops all along its length to this quiet hotel recommended by sir wyville thompson which offers a refuge from the nasal twang of my fellow voyagers who have all gone to the caravan sorels on the bund the host is a frenchman but he relies on a chinaman the servants are japanese boys in japanese clothes and there is a japanese groom of the chambers in faultless english costume who perfectly appalls me by the elaborate politeness of his manner almost as soon as i arrived i was obliged to go in search of mr fraser's office in the settlement i say search for there are no names on the streets where there are numbers they have no sequence and i met no europeans on foot to help me in my difficulty yokohama does not improve on further acquaintance it has a dead alive look it has irregularity without picturesqueness and the gray sky 
gray sea gray houses and gray roofs look harmoniously dull no foreign money except the mexican dollar passes in japan and mr fraser's comprador soon metamorphosed my english gold into japanese setsu or paper money a bundle of yen nearly a par just now with the dollar packets of fifty twenty and ten sen notes and some rouleau of very neat copper coins the initiated recognize the different denominations of paper money at a glance by their differing colors and sizes but at present they are a distracting mystery to me the notes are pieces of stiff paper with chinese characters at the corners near which with exceptionally good eyes or a magnifying glass one can discern an english word denoting the value they are very neatly executed and are ornamented with chrysanthemum crest of the mikado and the interlaced dragons of the empire i long to get away into real japan mr wilkinson h b m s acting consul called yesterday and was extremely kind he thinks that my plan for travelling in the interior is rather too ambitious but that it is perfectly safe for a lady to travel alone and agrees with everybody else in thinking that legions of fleas and the miserable horses are the great drawbacks of japanese travelling end of letter one by isabella l bird Furisode by Lafcadio Hearn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. Furisode by Lafcadio Hearn for the Tales of the Cities compilation. Recently, while passing through a little street tenanted chiefly by dealers in old wares, I noticed a furisode or long-sleeved robe of the rich purple tint called Murasaki, hanging before one of the shops. It was a robe such as might have been worn by a lady of rank in the time of the Tokugawa. I stopped to look at the five crests upon it, and in the same moment there came to my recollection this legend of a similar robe said to have once caused the destruction of Yedo. Nearly two hundred and fifty years ago, the daughter of a rich merchant of the city of the shoguns while attending some temple festival perceived in the crowd a young samurai of remarkable beauty and immediately fell in love with him unhappily for her he disappeared in the press before she could learn through her attendants who he was or whence he had come but his image remained vivid in her memory even to the least detail of his costume the holiday attire then worn by samurai youths was scarcely less brilliant than that of young girls, and the upper dress of this handsome stranger had seemed wonderfully beautiful to the enamoured maiden. She fancied that by wearing a robe of like quality and colour, bearing the same crest, she might be able to attract his notice on some future occasion. Accordingly, she had such a robe made, with very long sleeves, according to the fashion of the period and she prized it greatly she wore it whenever she went out and when at home she would suspend it in her room and try to imagine the form of her unknown beloved within it sometimes she would pass hours before it dreaming and weeping by turns and she would pray to the gods and the buddhas that she might win the young man's affection often repeating the invocation of the Nichi ren sect, namu mio ho renge kyo, but she never saw the youth again, and she pined with longing for him, and sickened, and died, and was buried. After her burial, the long-sleeved robe that she had so much prized was given to the Buddhist temple of which her family were parishioners. It is an old custom to thus dispose of the garments of the dead. The priest was able to sell the robe at a good price, for it was a costly silk, and bore no traces of the tears that had fallen upon it. It was bought by a girl of about the same age as the dead lady. She wore it only one day. Then she fell sick, and began to act strangely. 
crying out that she was haunted by the vision of a beautiful young man and that for love of him she was going to die and within a little while she died and the long-sleeved robe was a second time presented to the temple again the priest sold it and again it became the property of a young girl who wore it only once then she also sickened and talked of a beautiful shadow and died and was buried and the robe was given a third time to the temple and the priest wondered and doubted nevertheless he ventured to sell the luckless garment once more once more it was purchased by a girl and once more worn and the wearer pined and died and the robe was given a fourth time to the temple then the priest felt sure that there was some evil influence at work and he told his acolytes to make a fire in the temple court and to burn the robe so they made a fire into which the robe was thrown but as the silk began to burn there suddenly appeared upon it dazzling characters of flame the characters of the invocation namu mio ho renge kyo and these one by one leapt like great sparks to the temple roof and the temple took fire embers from the burning temple presently dropped upon neighboring roofs and the whole street was soon ablaze then a sea wind rising blew destruction into further streets and the conflagration spread from street to street and from district into district till nearly the whole of the city was consumed and this calamity which occurred upon the eighteenth day of the first month of the first year of meriki sixteen fifty five is still remembered in tokyo as the furisod kwaji the great fire of the long-sleeved robe according to a story-book called kibun dejin the name of the girl who caused the robe to be made was osami and she was the daughter of hiko yiman a wine merchant of hyakushu machi in the district of azebu because of her beauty she was also called azebu komachi or the komachi of azebu the same book says that the temple of the tradition was a nichiren temple called hon miyoji in the district of hongo and that the crest upon the robe was a kikyo flower but there are many different versions of the story and i distrust the kibun daijin because it asserts that the beautiful samurai was not really a man but a transformed dragon or water serpent that used to inhabit the lake at uyeno shino bazu no ike after more than a thousand years the name of komachi or ono no komachi is still celebrated in japan she was the most beautiful woman of her time and so great a poet that she could move heaven by her verses and cause rain to fall in time of drought many men loved her in vain and many are said to have died for love of her but misfortunes visited her when her youth had passed and after having been reduced to the uttermost want she became a beggar and died at last upon the public highway near kyoto as it was thought shameful to bury her in the foul rags found upon her some poor person gave a worn-out summer robe katabira to wrap her body in and she was interred near arashiyama at a spot still pointed out to travellers as the place of katabira no tsuchi end of furisod by lafcario hearn